ladies and gentlemen, welcome, 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 welcome to Donna Just Being Real. My channel is all about dating, love, relationships, and toxic relationship advice channel. All things relationship, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I use tri um, trials, uh, crime stories, crimes of passion, etc., etc. All these things as teaching tools to help people to date smart and not thirsty. And to look out for the red flags in a person. Okay, so we back on this ham hock face Henry Dinkins trial day 14 i'm going to be showing the closing arguments but at the current time they already had the closing arguments so now it's just on the judge to make a decision right and i don't know how long that's going to take people's asking me i really don't have a clue i thought it was going to be like tuesday or today but then i heard someone else's commentary somewhere they said the judge has up to a month or something but hey we have to think about it this is different. This is not a jury that made decisions to judge. And the judge has several other cases, not just ham hock. So, hey, it is what it is. All right, but if you need to reach out to me for viewers' requests or coaching and dating, love, relationship, toxic relationship, and need advice on, feel free to contact me. You look in the description, you'll find my email address. All right, and also if you need to speak to me about something on the side or whatever, anything like that, feel comfortable, feel free. All right, and today is also going to be um, open panel, so anybody can come up on the panel if they like and share their thoughts and opinions. All right, and thank you to everybody who's been sending um, channel blessings and the thank yous and all this good stuff. I really appreciate it. I really do. Thank you so much. I'm glad everybody's enjoying my commentary and watching a lot of my old commentary, too. I appreciate that, too. All right, but make sure you hit that like, subscribe, share the content out to your social media, leave some feedback, tell me what you think, what you think of this whole thing. And I also did more commentary, if you just knew here, other commentary on this ham hock. So go back and check out my commentary I did with the grandma, the girlfriend, the mother, and etc., etc. All right. So let's get into this one right here. All right, so today, like I said, we're going to focus on the closing arguments. So let's listen to these closing arguments and hear what... She had already conceived Reagent Terrell. Reagent was two at the time that she met Henry D. Mm. That started a little quicker than I thought. All right, let's um, listen to the closing arguments of prosecution. And then this is first is prosecution. Then we're going to get into defense. Let's get it, ladies and gentlemen. Dinkins. And then by virtue of the relationship the two of them engaged in, she um, became pregnant with DL and conceived the child. Um, there was discussion about the nature of the relationship. I'm so sorry I keep stopping and rewinding. The reason why I did that because I wanted to say is the speed is on 1.25, ladies and gentlemen. If it's too fast for you, hit your setting. You can slow it. You can make it faster. Whatever is comfortable for you, just do. Okay? But the speed right now we're listening to is 1.25. Now, let's get it. She had already conceived Briasia Terrell. Briasia was two at the time that she met Henry Dinkins. And then by virtue of the relationship that the two of them engaged in, she um, became pregnant with Yale and conceived the child. Um, there was discussion about the nature of the relationship that existed as far as the family dynamics between Mr. Dinkins, um, Aisha Langford, um, and the children. Um, and I think what's very interesting to point out um, is conversations that occurred during the defendant's interview with Detective Obert um, that um, actually took on two different perspectives um, relative to the relationship that he shared with Aisha Langford during the initial stages of the interview and then the relationship that he shared with Aisha Langford um, toward the latter stages of the inter interview. But at any rate, here's what we know. Aisha Langford had indicated um, that when she began um, dating Mr. Dinkins, she was of the impression that Mr. Dinkins was much younger um, than um, he was. Um, he was an individual who had represented himself as being in his late 20s. Um, at some point in time, by virtue of the relationship that she shared with him, she discovered that he was a much older man. Um, she did indicate that he was very much involved in the children's lives during that initial stage um, of their um, relationship, but then time passed and that was not how you would characterize the dynamics that existed as far as Mr. Deacons um, having contact with um, any of the three children on a regular basis, or being a father who was actively involved in DL's life. Um, Aisha Langford, in helping us understand what that relationship was, very simply she indicated that he was an individual that when he got a new car or a new girlfriend, he would show up to show off. 
That being said, let's go ahead and let's set the stage for what occurred during the summer of 2020. During the month of June, and at this point in time, Briasia is 10 years of age, um, I eat Aisha had talked about how there had been um, a cookout that had taken place down by the river, I believe. Um, she had attended the cookout with the children. Um, that was her first opportunity to meet Andrea Culberson, who was um, Mr. Dinkins' girlfriend. Um, that this was an event that Mr. Dinkins was present at, and I believe, but I would ask the courts to draw on its own recollection, um, I believe that he was the individual who was in charge of the cookout. Um, at any rate, um, you have what would be a scenario where there's more recent contact that occurred where Mr. Dinkins then is um, a father figure that DL um, has had contact with, uh, with in June. And then as of July 8th of 2020, as Ms. Langford indicated, when they were driving down the street with DL in the car, they happened to her observe Mr. Dinkins pull into a quick shop. At that point in time, DL expressed an interest in being able to talk with his father and see his father, which prompted Ms. Langford to pull into the quick shop and have a conversation with Mr. Dinkins about how he needed to be more involved in his son's life and he needed to spend time with his son. As a result of that conversation, we know that the discussion opened up to Mr. Dinkins taking DL um, on July 9th so that he could spend some time with his son. Um, and then through um, out the course of July 9th through telephone records, the court was able to see that there was various contacts that had occurred. Um, but at any rate, we know that, on, I should say July 8th, let me correct that. On July 9th, that was the date that Mr. Dinkins um, picked DL up. Now, on July 9th, Aisha Langford was at work. She was working at Checkers there on East Locust Street. And so as a mother, her understanding of what was to transpire was very simply that Mr. Deacons was going to respond over to her mother's house, pick up DL, and take his son, his biological son, and spend time with him. When Mr. Deacons arrived there at the residence of Danita Gardner, who is the biological grandmother, the um, situation changed. Um, and as far as the events that developed there um, at the Gardner residence, Ms. Gardner described how she had been in the back room when Mr. Dinkins got there, um, when he came inside the residence and he was going to be gathering up his sons to leave. The conversation developed into Briasia um, being interested and wanting to come along. Aisha Langford had described that Briasia and DL were very, very close as um, siblings and quite honestly, they were attached at the hip um, and it would not have been a surprise to her that DL would want his sister to go along with him. And so the um, conversation developed wherein Mr. Deacons um, had um, consented to Briasia coming along. But, was, but what was very interesting about that conversation is this. CS, the 13-year-old child and the teenager out of the group, wanted to be able to come along. And Mr. Deacons would not allow him to accompany DL and his sister. Danita Gardner, during her testimony, spoke to that particular issue. Um, as she spoke to the fact that Aisha had no idea that Briasia actually ended up leaving her residence and accompanying Mr. Um, Deacons. But at any rate, that, that prompted a telephone call wherein Miss Gardner had advised her daughter that Briasia actually was going to go and spend time with Mr. Deacons, her younger brother, and that once she got off work, she would need to pack up clothing to take over to the apartment that Mr. Deacons shared with Andrea Culberson there at Jersey Meadows' apartment, which we now know is apartment number eight. Aisha Langford, she gets off work. She goes to her mother's residence, um, and I think um, one of the things um, that um, is important for purposes of discussion is this. We know that Aisha and her children were in a transition period. Um, they um, were in the process of having moved from a prior residence, um, and she had the children's items back um, boxed up. So when she went to her mother's residence, um, she um, got together clothing for Briasia. She got together clothing for DL, and within that clothing, um, she packed pajamas for both of the children to wear. Um, additionally, there was footwear that um, would have gone over to the residence. And then once she um, had accomplished that task, she drove over to the Jersey Meadow apartment complex to drop the clothing off. Now, before we go further into a discussion about those particular details, I think it's important to stop and talk about Briasia as a child. One of the things that the state had talked with Aisha Langford about was whether or not Jersey Meadows apartment complex was a location that this child was familiar with, that either child was familiar with. Um, and she indicated that, no, this was the first time um, that um, the children had ever been to this apartment complex. This was not an apartment complex that Briasia was familiar with. This was not an apartment complex that there were family members who lived at. Um, this was not an apartment complex that Briasia had friends that she um, knew. Um, and the reason that I bring that issue up 
is that I think it's very relevant to considering what happened in the middle of the night when Andrea Culberson woke up and found that Briasia was gone from the apartment. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. But I think that we've got to stop and we've got to consider these circumstances. Because in conjunction with that conversation, um, one of the conversations that occurred with Aisha Langford on the stand um, it is um, a conversation about the personality of Briasia. Was Briasia the type of child who was prone to waking up in the middle of the night and wandering off? Um, and um, Aisha um, described her children as being very sound sleepers. Um, and the grandmother even spoke to that particular issue. Um, and that once she went down, that child went down. But the other thing about Briasia, Briasia was a rule follower. She was not the type of child who would just get up and leave on her own. But even more importantly, Briasia was not the type of child who's going to get up in the middle of the night um, and leave an apartment in an apartment complex that she's not familiar with and just to wander off. Um, there was discussion during the course of the um, testimony, and I would ask the court to draw on its own recollection about this particular topic, but I believe both Aisha and Anita Gardner spoke to this, that Briasia was not a child who liked to go out in the dark. Now, Briasia was 10. Um, you consider a 10-year-old child in an environment that they are not familiar with. Um, and what's the likelihood that a child is going to get up in the middle of the night and just wander off? Beyond that, Briasia had some issues with her sight, Briasia had some issues with her hearing. But then even taking that a step further, the discussion that occurred was a description of her personality because the state thought that this was very important. What type of child is Briasia? And the one thing that Aisha talked about and even the grandmother had talked about is that Briasia was a truth teller. She was a child that would tell the truth no matter what. Um, and I think her grandmother's description was she described her as a tattletale. And so if her older brother or her younger brother were doing things that she didn't think was appropriate, Briasia was a child who was going to tell. And I think that, that particular personality attribute um, is something that um, has significant bearing on the events that played out through the course of the night of July 10th um, and going to the early morning hours of July 10th of 2020. Taking that and setting that discussion aside, I want to jump over to the interview of Mr. Deacons. Um, uh, when Detective Obert met with him um, at the Davenport Police Department after Mr. Dinkins arrived there sometime around noon. Now, in that opening interview, the court um, had the opportunity to observe the conversation um, Mr. Dinkins engaged in with Detective Obert, describing the family dynamic. Because at that point in time, essentially what we have, according, well, um, in terms of the perspective of law enforcement, is we have a child who is missing. And so the focus of that investigation is to try and gather any information that they could about family relationships and this child and a timeline of events so that information could be utilized um, to develop a plan to um, go out and search areas where Briasia might possibly be. During the context of that discussion about the family dynamics, Henry Deakins portrayed himself um, as a father figure to Briasia, how he considered her to be his daughter. And when you hear those types of statements being made in the interview, it creates its own impression. It creates the impression that we have a man who is very much a part of his family's life. It creates an impression that we have a man who is probably exercising regular visitation, is probably a figure within this family's life, you know, on any day through any given week. And so when you create that impression, um, what it does is it lends itself to perception, all right? And here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> when you stop to think about the human experience um, and relationships that any of us have with individuals, um, depending upon um, the um, length of that relationship, depending upon the um, character of that relationship, the amount of contact that occurs in that relationship, that forms perceptions. So you may think that you know an individual, but if you have a lot of contact with that individual, um, that tends to create a sense of trust. You know, and we form perceptions about that, and that is the basis by which we determine whether or not we feel comfortable around this individual, whether or not we trust this individual, whether or not we trust this individual around our children, and would feel comfortable with that individual spending time with our children. So Mr. Deakins, when he's talking about, you know, how he perceives himself, himself as a father figure to Briasia, we're left with the impression that this is an individual who is very much involved in Briasia's life. And um, uh, that being said, this is an individual as a father figure who would never do anything to hurt that child. Um, Mr. Dickens talked about how close he was with Aisha and how they had a very good working relationship together as far as co-parenting. But then when you get to the latter stages of the interview, the complexion of those comments changes drastically. 
and he describes how they have a very contentious relationship, um, how um, they really don't speak um, at all, um, and that's in stark contrast with what he would have led Detective Obert to believe during the initial stages. And that particular statement is in keeping with what Aisha Langford testified to about the family dynamic. And I think if we understand what the family dynamic is, it really speaks to comfort levels having an adult male who really isn't a father figure to Briasia, getting up in the middle of the night and removing this child from the apartment without communicating with his girlfriend about the departure, not communicating with Aisha Langford about the departure, and not offering any um, explanation as to a legitimate reason for leaving the apartment complex. So that dynamic is very, very important. Now let's go back then and let's talk about how the events developed during the evening of July 9th. You know that once Aisha went back to her mother's, she packed up clothing for the children, um, and she went over to the apartment complex. Um, Brigasia came down, was very happy. You know, the evening was going very well. Um, there was the puppy that had come with Aisha. Brigasia was excited about that. Um, and then there was the handoff of the clothing with the mother, you know, letting her child know that she loves her. Mom leaves. And as Aisha is driving west on 53rd, we know that the weather is such that it begins to rain. <clears throat> And it's a significant rain, so much so that Ms. Langford described how she had to pull over into a driveway over near um, North High because her windshield wipers couldn't keep up with the amount of rain that was coming down. The state brought that testimony out because it becomes very significant to later findings that were made when the maroon Chevy Impala was lifted on that hoist so that the gas tank could be dropped to measure the amount of gasoline. That rain explains soil conditions that would have existed um, over in the area of Kunau implement where Briasia's remains were later recovered six months later. And it was because of that rain and even discussions with other law enforcement officers um, who talked about the um, weather conditions throughout the night of July 10th. And when I talk about throughout the night, I'm talking about after the midnight hour, um, transitioning from July 9th into July 10th and going to the um, morning hours of July 10th. So we've got that significant rainfall. We have a mother then who returns back to her own mother's apartment. Aisha described being very, very tired and that um, essentially what she did was she just laid down on the couch and she fell asleep and she was dead to the world because she was so exhausted. Danita Gardner was asked about that same circumstance and she also talked about how her daughter lay down on the couch and went to sleep. Now, as far as the um, plans for July 10th, Aisha was to work. Her um, typical scheduled shift, she would have gone in at 11 but because one of her co-workers hadn't come in to work, that prompted her manager to call her before the 8 o'clock hour and ask her to come in because he needed somebody there um, to um, cover um, for that co-worker who had called in. And so Aisha left her mother's residence, had gone into work. As far as any contact that had occurred between Aisha and her children, we know the last point of direct contact was when she dropped the clothing off to Aisha. And then through the phone records, we know that we had been utilizing Mr. Deacon's phone because neither child had cell phones um, that um, would have gone to that apartment. And there was the communications where there were um, a call or two, I don't remember right now, but the records will speak to that. Um, Aisha was asleep, she didn't answer that, but then there was the text message that um, came through about something like, good night, mama, I love you, and then Aisha responding back um, later in the evening that um, she loved, um, you know, the two of the children um, and wishing them a good night. So the mother goes to sleep, everything Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to everybody that's coming here. Thank you for coming and thank you for hitting the like. But it looks like I have 83 people and I only have, how many likes do I have? I only have 27 likes. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, hit the like, hit the like, hit the like. And I'm going to also put the um, link in in a few minutes for um for the panel, open panel. If anybody wants to come up here and share their thoughts and opinions, just be respectful to everybody's thoughts and opinions, okay? That's, that's all I ask for. That's it, okay? And um, no do rags, no bonnets, no smoking, nothing like that. I really prefer if you just want to show yourself. This is more of a podcasting channel. That will be fine. All right, let's get back to it. And blessings to everybody's coming. Hope everybody having themselves a great evening and a great work day. Resume. Seemed fine. 
there would be no reason for concern or worry. What happens then? Let's talk about the dynamics of what's occurring um, from the perspective of DL, Bree Asia, Mr. Deakins, and Andrea Colerson. So, when Mr. Deakins picked the children up, we know that he went over to the 700 block of Taylor Street. That's one of the things that the officers had talked about. Um, where he went to a relative's house, Vince Howard. Um, the children hung out there with a couple of little girls. There were the um, adult male figures that were there. The children were playing video games. Um, and then um, after that visit concluded, the three subjects, Mr. Deakins, Briasia, and DL, went over to Andrea Culberson's apartment. That's the apartment that Mr. Deakins shared with Andrea Culberson. Now, I want to talk about the visit to Taylor Street, and here's why. You know, when we stop and consider the testimony that came out through the course of this trial, as far as individuals who could provide statements about what happened during the middle of the night of July 10th at apartment number 8 there at the Jersey Meadow Apartment Complex, we have an 8-year-old child, and then we have Andrea Culberson, the adult. Yes, um, yes, Nikki. This is the closing arguments when they wrap up everything. So she's giving her closing um, summary of the whole trial. And then after this, we're going to see what defense have to say. Their closing argument on this whole trial. Mm -hmm. But now we're just currently waiting for the verdict. And like I said, this might take a while, ladies and gentlemen. You have to remember, this is a bench trial. This is not a, um, you know, jury. So the procedure might be a little bit different. And you also have to remember, he's not the only case, the only docket out there. The judge got plenty more to do. But I think he has a time limit of when he posed to. I think somewhere I heard or whatever, I could be wrong, don't quote me on it, that I think he has a month to, to make a decision. So it's at his convenience. But anyway, it, Ham Hawk is not going to ever walk the streets again. Okay? Never going to walk the streets again. But we do want, Bre um, we do want justice for Bray. Yes, we do. Angel, this should have never happened to her. Resume. There's been a lot of discussion, you know, about a child who's eight years old and their ability to be able to recollect events, um, to be able to sequence those events, um, to be able to understand even what's going on. And during the course of interviews that you conduct with an eight-year-old, um, why is it that if you do um, an initial sit-down with the child, a child pro provides some details, but then when you extend that out, then the child um, is able to bring about more details? <coughs> the point that the state is going to make about DL is this. Everything that child described happening in his interviews formed the investigative construct for steps taken by officers of the Davenport Police Department in the investigation that they conducted. So, Mr. Dinkins, in his interview, after he picks up the children, describes having gone over to Vince Howard's house where the children played video games. That is absolutely consistent with what DL said. DL didn't know his father's friend's name, but he described going over to this house and spending time. Through the course of the um, investigation. One of the things that was talked about through the testimony, I believe, of Detective Obert, but I will ask the court to draw on its own recollection about this particular topic. That was an issue that was followed up by law enforcement. And Detective Obert did speak to this because Detective Obert and Detective Ann Siebert went over to Vince Howard's house on Taylor Street. Detective Siebert was at direct point of contact. Detective Obert was following some issues down, but they verified that yes, the children were there at the Howard residence, as Mr. Dinkins described, and as DL described. So then, when we go to the apartment complex, let's do the comparison between what Andrea Culberson describes happening and what DL describes what's happening. At no point in time is there ever any type of divergence in what it is that both parties relate. Andrea, we know, works for AT&T. Um, Andrea works for ho at, from home, um, and Andrea still was working her shift and didn't get off until 7-something in the evening. Um, Andrea has her workstation set up in the bedroom. She described how Briasia was fascinated by the work that she was doing and wanted to Wayne Lewis, he said, Ham Hop Prison. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> love it, love it. Resume. 
So the two spent some time, you know, bonding in that respect. And that was even something that Reisha was very excited to share with her mother. I bring that up because we're looking at issues of credibility throughout all of the testimony that was offered. And the one point that the state would definitely make is you see no discrepancies in testimony or statements provided by DL or in testimony or statements um, offered by Andrea Culberson um, and even like a small tangential issue like that relative to Aisha Langford and what she described happening. So the children are there in the apartment. We know the apartment is very small. We know that it is an upper level apartment that has its own staircase dedicated to the apartment itself. So you come in that door, you go up the stairs, and you get to the top of the stairs, um, and as you get to the top of the stairs and you look over to your left, that's the main living area. We know it's just kind of an open area where we've got the living room with the kitchen combination. And then we know if you were standing at the top of the staircase and you were looking at the wall ahead of you, um, basically if you go just a little bit further up toward the living room kitchen area, we've got that door that leads into the only bedroom that's there in that apartment. Um, and interestingly enough about that, you have to access that bedroom to go to the bathroom. And the other point of interest is this. The bedroom window itself actually faces out onto the parking lot. So the court um, had the ability to see the orientation of how you would access apartment number eight. Um, in order to get to apartment number eight, you had to go along the east side of the property, which essentially lies to the west of Costco. So it's back along that wooded line that separates the property of Costco to the back of Jersey Meadows. That window in the bedroom looks out onto the parking lot and the court certainly understands the import of that. Um, throughout the night, Mr. Deacons agrees with this, Andrea agrees with this, Deal talks about this. Deal's playing video games in the living room. Briasia is in the bedroom and she's playing her own video game. DL, as an eight-year-old child, brings that issue up because he is there to spend time with his father. But he notes his father is spending time in the bedroom with Briasia as she's playing a video game. And Andrea Culberson gives us a little bit more perspective because she talks about how the three of them are sitting on the bed and they're playing some type of game where they're passing back and forth. But you have a father who's supposed to be spending time with his son and he makes the choice to spend time in the bedroom with this 10-year-old little girl. And what we saw during the interview of DL that bothered him and it made him mad because his father was supposed to be spending time with him, but his father was making the choice to spend time with his sister. At any rate, we know that at some point during the course of the evening, um, the children take the showers. Um, uh, there's complete agreement on that particular topic. We know that they have dinner. We know that rather than the children dressing in the pajamas that Aisha had brought over, Mr. Dinkins selected large white t-shirts for the two children to wear. Now why? Mr. Deacon's t-shirt is a 4XL. Why would you want to put a 4XL on a 10-year-old child? It makes no sense. But when you think about that article of clothing, men's white t-shirts are very common articles of clothing. And knowing what occurred to Briasia, if Briasia were dressed in her own clothing, and we know that those clothes were later returned to Aisha, who went through those clothing, that, clothing, that, that bag of clothing, actually ended up being two bags of clothing, um, when they returned, she went through that clothing to try and identify what articles of clothing were missing, and there wasn't any missing. If Briasia had been dressed in her own little clothes, and Aisha did that inventory, she could say, law enforcement, these articles of clothing didn't come back. But Briasia is dressed in this white large t-shirt and her little black shorts and her little sports bra. So, Miguel and Andrea Culberson, again, are absolutely consistent on what happened. Briasia goes to bed first. Andrea lays down on that air mattress in the living room where she and Mr. Dinkins were to sleep. She goes down sometime around 11 o'clock. She hears Mr. Dinkins say to DL, you got till a little after 12 to finish playing that video game, and you're going down <clears throat> to bed. DL indicates that his father's the third to go to sleep, and that he is the fourth individual to go to sleep. DL and Andrea both describe DL sleeping at the foot of the bed. And Briasia is up toward the top of the bed. Now, why do I even focus on that detail? Because, again, we're looking at an eight-year-old child who is providing information about activities. And everything that that child describes... Only in New York can you find a student
is a complete agreement with what is described by the adult in that apartment complex. All right, so then the question very simply is this. What happened after everyone went to sleep? We know definitively what happened in that apartment at 3 o'clock. We know that Andrea woke up to go to the bathroom. She noted Henry Dinkins wasn't there. She walks into the bedroom. She doesn't have her glasses on. But Aisha, I'm sorry, Briasia, is not up there on the right side of the bed. DL is still down at the base of the bed asleep. Andrea goes to the bathroom, thinks, let me get my glasses on to make sure that I'm seeing what I'm seeing. She puts her glasses on. Briasia's not there. She checks throughout the apartment. Briasia's not there. Andrea Culberson is very clear, at no point in time did Mr. Dinkins ever wake her up and indicate that he was going to be leaving that apartment with Briasia, that there was a potential medical emergency, that he had to take her to the hospital, um, that um, maybe the child was missing her mother and wanted to go home. There were no communications whatsoever. Andrea Culberson did not feel comfortable at all with her discovery. Now, Andrea Culberson testified she'd been involved in a relationship with Mr. Dinkins for six years, and she is not feeling comfortable at all. She feels so uncomfortable, she tells in her, or describes for the court in her testimony, that she didn't even want to think about the possibilities of why Mr. Dinkins was gone and why Briasia was gone. But she's so unsettled, rather than going to bed, she chooses to sit up in the living room in the dark to wait for Mr. Dinkins' return. She tried reaching out to contact him, but found that his cell phone was there in the apartment. All right, thank you for this on Tippet. R.J. Sim, Sim says, in most bench trials, a judge has up to 60 days to come back with a verdict. 60? Wow. Ooh, that's a long time. Hmm. Oh, well, he ain't going nowhere. <laughs> but we all do want justice for Bree. I can, you know, I can understand everybody wants the verdict to be, you know, you know, done and out there. But thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing, everybody. And I'm going to have open panel a little bit later. I just want to wait till we get through the um, closing arguments. This is prosecution right now of closing arguments. And if you didn't hit the like, make sure you hit the like right now. And share me out on your social media. And feel free to check out any of my past commentary. I have some great animations on crimes and love stories, romance, and all that good stuff. All right. And I'll be doing animations soon. Yeah, very soon. We'll get back to it. All right. Resume. Um, she talked about it charging, but then the question was also asked, is Mr. Jenkins the type of individual that goes around without his phone? And she said, no, he's not. Recognizing that the phone was plugged into a charger, this takes us to the photographs of the maroon Chevy Impala. And the core has had the opportunity to observe photographs that has that white ox cord um, and another cord that could be used for charging cell phones. But that phone is there in the apartment. And the state asserts that that is significant. Why? Because cell phones are devices that document the location of where that phone has traveled to. If an individual is abducting a child from an apartment complex, the last thing that you want is a digital device on your person to document locations that you are going. Because that provides leads to law enforcement. And those leads then can be utilized to determine what had occurred. So the phone's there in the apartment. Turning the imagined into reality for over 95. Aisha Langford gives us a very definitive time of 3.30, based on the clock on her desk. She said that she's sitting there in the dark. Mr. Deacons very quietly unlocks the door and very quietly comes up the stairs into the apartment in such a way so as not to awake anyone. Mr. Deacons, of course, was not anticipating that Andrea Culberson would be up and would have discovered that both he and Briasia were gone from the apartment. Now, I'm going to step outside this conversation. I want to take us to the time frame of 
um, 8.55 in the morning of the Jersey Meadow apartment complex when Officer Burkle had responded to that location. In Mr. Dinkins' conversations with Officer Burkle, he created the impression that he wasn't familiar with this apartment complex and didn't even live there. And if the court will go back and reflect to the video footage that was collected from Officer Burkle's body-worn camera, Officer Burkle had said, you know, I know this sounds strange, um, but oftentimes um, when children come up missing, if law enforcement goes in and we do a search, we end up finding the children in closets or under the beds. Would you mind if I went into the apartment and conducted a search? What was Mr. Dickens' response? We've already searched the, air, <clears throat> the area. Officer Burkle persists. So Henry Dinkins then goes over to apartment eight, and rather than walking into that apartment, where he clearly lives, as described by Andrea Culberson, and he even has a closet that contains only his clothing, he knocks there at the door, as if he would simply be a guest, and he would have to wait for the tenant of that apartment to come down and answer the door. Ms. Culberson comes down the stairs. Officer Burkle's right there at that front door. He has the conversation with Mr. Ms. Culberson about being able to go in and search and explained, you know, he had lost his own children like a child the week before. Um, she's very hesitant. She looks out the door. Mr. Dinkins isn't right there by Officer Burkle. He's several feet down the sidewalk near the corner of the building. Ms. Culberson looks out and says, is it okay with him? As if she's got to get permission. And Officer Burkle says yes. And then she says, well, the apartment's a mess. The court had an opportunity to see the apartment. Quite honestly, it wasn't a mess. And then Officer Burkle goes out. Briege is not there, but Henry Dinkins leaves the apartment complex and nobody can find him. All right? So let's go back into the equation of the discussion that we had. Andrea makes it known to Mr. Dinkins that she is awake and she knows he's gone and she knows Briege is gone. Mr. Dinkins is not responding in any way to give information to her about what is going on. He goes into the bedroom to his closet and he digs in the closet. The court's been able to see the relationship of the bed to the closet on what would be the right side of that bed. Andrea Culberson describes going to the window, looking out onto the parking lot, and there the maroon Chevy Impala is parked. Briasia is standing right next to the passenger side of that vehicle. There's no just, um, question in her mind that it's Briasia. She talked about how she has very distinctive hair, uh, but also she talked about how the child had been dressed in this white big t-shirt of Mr. Dinkins. Briasia's there. She can't see what Mr. Dinkins is getting out of his closet, but he puts it away in his clothing in such a way that she doesn't know what he's gotten out of the closet. Now, to take the court's attention back to testimony that she had offered here in court, and also testimony that DL had offered here in court, they both talked about how he had been wearing a black shirt. I throw that out because that is consistent with what Jared Brink had testified to when he had the contact with that black male subject over there on Highway 61 and then when he drove him over to the area of 270th Avenue. I also bring that up for this reason. Um, there was much ado being made about the fact that Mr. Dinkins was wearing um, that um, white t-shirt, a man's undershirt that had no sleeves on it when we see him going into the quick shop and leaving. But then Mr. Brink is describing the black male subject having on some type of black shirt. The state went to photographs taken of articles removed from that vehicle. What do we see? We see an article of black clothing that had been taken out of the front passenger compartment. We also see a box of clothing in the rear portion of that trunk. To be able to pull an article of clothing out, put it on, take it off, is something that's very easy to do. But I bring that up because I think it's very important to mention before the state forgets that. So then, when Mr. Dinkins goes down that staircase, Andrea Culberson looks out, the Impala's gone, Mr. Dinkins gone, and Briasia is gone. She was asked specifically when she looked out, saw Briasia there, did you see any activity in the parking lot? None. Any individuals around? None. Those questions were asked because the assertion being from defense is that if Andrea did not see Mr. Dinkins get into that Impala, if Andrea did not see Briasia get into that Impala, then there's no evidence to show that Briasia was with Henry Dinkins, and the state absolutely disagrees with that. That sequence of events and the observations of Andrea Culberson absolutely answers that question. Mr. Dinkins 
left Jersey Meadow apartment complex with Briasia in the car, and we know that Briasia is still alive at 3.30. But what has happened before 3.30 and before Andrea's discovery that Briasia is missing? DL gives us a perspective. He talks about being asleep. He talks about how he's kicked very hard by his sister. There was a discussion about, is this simply a sibling who's rolling around, you know, and maybe they touched. No, this was different. This hurt. And then DL, why he, while he didn't um, recollect that during his testimony, when he was interviewed on June 10th, described noticing his sister missing, hearing his father's voice, peeking out the bedroom, and seeing his father go down those stairs with Briasia and talking with her about cars. An interesting point that the child brings up when I used Mr. Langford says that Mr. Dinkins only comes around when he gets a new car or he gets a new girlfriend. So, what's happened between or before 3 a.m.? So between the time that everybody's gone down to bed, with Dale being the last individual in that house to fall asleep, what has happened between that time frame and 3 o'clock when Andrea makes the discovery? Now, before I talk about this, I want, um, I've got um, a demonstrative exhibit that actually is a collection of still images that were a part of the exhibits the state has introduced. But, Your Honor, just for purposes of perspective, let's go back down and let's just discuss the area of Schmidt Road and Credit Island if we can. We know that River Drive is um, our southernmost east-west street, and we know that the area that we're going to be talking about um, where Mr. Dinkins' RV is parked and Credit Island, that's in an area of town that's more industrial in nature. Um, and so during this time of night, in the middle of the night, um, there's not a lot of activity there, okay? So we know that Credit Island um, is on the south side of River Drive. We know that um, the um, southernmost point will be the Mississippi River um, that runs um, east and west along that area. We know that um, Schmidt Road, if you um, come out of Credit Island and you turn right or travel east, Schmidt Road essentially is about 400 meters. So the distance of um, one lap around the track. And, and I think that that was a very good way of describing it so that the court would understand the um, uh, um, uh, closeness of both entry points so that the, the court will understand it takes very little time to travel from Schmidt Road to enter onto Credit Island. Now, <clears throat> Schmidt Road we know is a north-south street. Um, at the southernmost point, this is where you turn onto River Drive. Um, it's not a very long street because then um, at its northern point, it turns onto Rockingham, which is our east-west street. And we know if we go further east, it turns into Seven. High Beat is our most western point on Rockingham that has video surveillance feed that gives us information about what happened after the trip to Clinton that morning. Then we know that Purina is a factory that is there at the corner of Rockingham and Schmidt Road. It lies on the eastern side of Rockingham and uh, Schmidt. We know if you go from north to south on the east side, we've got Purina. We've got 743 Schmidt Road. That is that um, area where individuals can store their vehicles. We know that that's where Mr. Dinkins' RV was stored. And then we know then um, Jack's break in alignment um, is um, the um, southernmost building there. We've got video surveillance equipment on jack break and alignment, and this is a constant feed, so it never stops. We know at high V it's a constant feed. We know at Purina it's a constant feed. But then to the um, east of both 743 Schmidt and jack break and alignment, we have Devon Self Storage. We've got cameras affixed to this building, but they're only motion activated. All right, so those are our variables that we're working with. And then we know over here on River Drive, just to the west of Credit Island, if you come out of Credit Island and you look across the street, if you go down there and you ride your bike, you know, and you're familiar with the bike path down there, there's the bait shop. And then a couple of houses over is Sarah Lowe's residence. Her video um, surveillance equipment is affixed to the front of the house. And so then we know that in terms of the angle of that um, camera feed, it shows us that entry point onto Credit Island. So that sets our perspective there. And we understand the relationship of the cameras and activity and how that activity would have been picked up. All right. Let's go to the state's first demonstrative exhibit. Now, as we read this, Your Honor, we're going to read from left to right. <coughs> At 
I have to pause to read this comment. Because Wayne, Wayne Lewis is saying, and this is what I be preaching about on my channel. Like I said, I talk a lot about dating, love, relationship, toxic relationship, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I use all these things as teaching tools so people can date smart and not thirsty. Because when you date thirsty, you will be a target of being used and abused. And someone says something about her being handicapped. I can't remember who just said that past in the comments. See, these type of predators, they, they, they manipulate and they, they choose these type of women who have low self-esteem, who's extremely overweight, who has something wrong with them, and they feel like no other man's going to want them. And then this loser come around ham hock face, and he preaches all this, oh, baby, you look good. Oh, yeah, I'll accept you. You know, I don't understand. You have a beautiful person. And all this. And she's like, <laughs> she's all gullible. And she's believing this crap. But he's just love bombing her because he's about to destroy her or use her. Just like he was using her car. Now let me see what Wayne um, um Wayne said. Some women are too weak minded and are mentally controlled by men like this. The woman dare not to speak up or confront her fear of whatever he would do. Mm-hmm. And it's really pathetic. It really is. When she sat there and said the body cam... The, is, is he alright with this? Who cares? Who cares? He's living in your roof. He's not even providing for you. He will be a drug dealer, but God, dog, what is he giving you? Nothing. He's just using you as a place to lay his head while he can go out here and hustle and do what he wants to do. And drive around in your cars, put your, putting your names in the cars. He just used you. For six years, you was the one he could use to register his cars, to leave his guns at, and all this. And she let him. See, ladies, you got to stop entertaining these type of guys. If you do, this is what's going to be the outcome. All right, let's get back to it. Resume. Make sure you hit the like. 13 a.m. We see a vehicle. And it's a sedan. It's not a pickup. It's not a van. It's not an RV. We see a passenger vehicle traveling North Funchnet Road. Let's stop and think about this. So what would be the most direct route of travel down to River Drive? If you leave that apartment complex, you travel down 53rd, heading west. You get on I-74, um, heading south. You exit on River Drive, heading west, and that will take you out to the area of Schmidt Road and um, Credit Island. So it makes sense that that vehicle is heading north because it's turned from River Drive heading north. That is at 2.13 a.m. I would ask the court to pay attention to the shape of what we see, the outline or the contours of this particular vehicle. Because when you stop and consider those contours and the shape, and you look at what we've seen about that vehicle, when we've seen it during the daylight hours, and how it seems like it just kind of slopes down a little bit toward the front, and maybe there's a bit of an elevation toward the rear, this is exactly consistent with that. So that vehicle is heading north at 2.13 a.m. Now, at Devon South Storage, we see Mr. Deacon's RV right here. And we see a vehicle departing the lot at 229. So between 213 and 229, we're talking about a time frame of 60 minutes roughly. Okay? Then we go down and we see that vehicle south on Schmidt Road and look at the shape of the vehicle. It is similar. That's at 230. Then the vehicle turns around at 2.31 going back north. So something is happening that makes that vehicle turn around within a time frame of a minute. So at 2.31 it's going back north on Schmidt Road. Then we have the camera at Devon Cell Storage motion activated and we can see the vehicle now leaving the area of Mr. Jenkins' motorhome at 249. This particular video feed about um, when the court had the ability to observe it up on the screen, we got a better perspective of what type of vehicle was leaving that lot and it was consistent with a passenger vehicle. So 249, it's leaving, then we've got it south on Schmidt Road at 250. So between 231 and 249, we're talking about 18 minutes. 18 minutes back in that area plus an additional 16 minutes. So what's that giving us? That's giving us 34 minutes. What is going on in this RV over the course of 34 minutes? The court knows that this particular RV is not equipped for anybody to live there. There was no food in the refrigerator. 
There is um, no way to hook that RV up to water or anything at all. Um, there certainly were personal items that were being stored. So there, there's a bed there that has bedding on it. Um, there's clothing and shoes and things like that. And this is a location that is um, attributable to being Mr. Dinkins' RV. But then, when it leaves south on Schmidt Road, it goes on to Credit Island, entering Credit Island at 251, and then leaving Credit Island at 253. All right. That was a topic of discussion that came up with Detective Obert um, and what was going on in this area of town. And I would ask the court to draw on its own recollection about how they were focusing on any type of cell activity um, to determine what, whether or not there was activity in that area with other individuals. And there was. So, there's two photographs that I want to point out to the court. The top photograph is the perspective of the camera angle when law enforcement got in with a search warrant where we can see that bed and then right there on a wooden box we have a cleaning product and as um, the court can see that cleaning product has bleach within it. This trial has spoken very extensively about the import of bleach. Bleach destroys DNA. The state finds it very significant that you've got a cleaning product right there by that bed. And the state finds it very significant that relative to all of the articles of evidence that were sent to the um, FBI laboratory in Quantico, or even the DCI laboratory, no DNA on anything. <coughs> it was actually clean. Um, isn't that what we would expect to find if an individual has the knowledge base to recognize the import of bleach and its ability to kill DNA? And we have that there, but we also have that as a product that Mr. Jenkins has purchased um, a little after 7 a.m. in Clinton. The state also points out this um, machete that was above the um, uh, microwave. If the court looks very closely at those photographs, one of the things that the child talked about is how his father had wiped that machete down with a rag. The court can see the fibers within this machete. Um, we had our analyst come in from Quantico who testified to that, and she did indicate, Linda Otterstadter, I believe it was, she did indicate that there were fibers within that. It didn't match um, a um, white and pink and I think purple striped um, cloth that was in the console, the Impala, and it didn't match that um, white um, uh, washcloth that went back with the children's clothing. But through the testimony, we know that there was a white washcloth at Andrea's that had been used to clean operations feet because they'd gotten money, all right? And so it didn't match. But the point being, the child had described it being wiped down and he talked about there being bleach. Now moving beyond that, so this is all the activity that happens even before Mr. Beacon returns to apartment 8. This evidence here speaks to what Mr. Deacon's intent was. For him to take that 10-year-old child from this apartment in the middle of the night and take her over to this area of town to an RV speaks to his intent. And the state asserts when you consider these circumstances and you consider the purchase of bleach and the use of bleach, this child was sexually assaulted in this area. But then it became very clear to Mr. Dinkins that there was going to be no way for him to control this child. And so therefore, it forced him to take further action, which was the murdering of Reasia Troyal. And so his returning to the apartment the complex. Why are you looking like that, Ham Hawk? Because she's talking facts? You've been exposed. You don't like it, do you? Can't stand it. You sick low life. You got with that woman because she had that lo young little girl and you was grooming. Being all sweet and nice to the mother, to the grandma. Mm hmm. It was all a grooming process. You've been looking at that girl for a little girl for a long time. And like so many other little girls. You should go to hell in a handbasket. You should have never been born. Nope. You should have never been born. Reason. At 3.30, the um, item that um, he got, the state of service, is a gun. Now, let's go ahead and let's talk about the sequence of events from 3 a.m. to 3.45 a.m., which really speak to the issue of his intent, his premeditation, um, and the fact that he was going to um, uh, deliberately and willfully murder this child.
Welcome, Jackie. Glad to have you. Welcome aboard to Donna Just Being Real. And to anybody else who's new, welcome aboard to Donna Just Being Real. And feel free to check out my past commentary. Feel free. And if you need to reach out to me, look inside the description and you will find my email. Resume. After 3.30 a.m. And 3.30 a.m. is measured by the clock in Andrea's um, apartment. We know that he went to the quick shop um, on 53rd Street. Um, the counters are two minutes off. So we see, based on its date of 17 2020, that in Powell is entering at 3.30, it's actually 3.32 a.m. in the morning. We see Mr. Jenkins pull up to the gas pump. Um, as the court can see, the dark tint on those windows precludes anyone from being able to look into the vehicle to see what was going on. But when he gets out of the car and he walks into the store, he's got that lanyard with his keys on him. He goes into the store, he makes the purchases. One of the things that is noted through testimony is the number of times that he kept looking out to that car. Now, if you pull up to a gas pump in the middle of the night, you know, you have concerns about someone, you know, potentially getting in your car and stealing it and leaving it. Well, there's two ways to deal with that. You lock it. Um, and in this particular case, we know that Mr. Deacons didn't leave his keys in the car because we've got that lanyard with him and those keys. He's gone in, he looks out the car, it's very clear that he's very interested in that vehicle, and then when he goes to the pump, he gets in the car after um, he starts pumping gas and he gets out after it's concluded. Why did Mr. Deacons need to fill up with a full tank of gas? Um, the receipt was introduced. He purchased $34 worth of gas. What's a very important point to discuss here at this juncture is the fact that he presented a $100 bill. And then he got um, um, a 40 some dollars back. I'm not quite sure what that figure is. I bring that up because then we need to go full circle back to um, his interview with Detective Obert. When he was asked by Detective Obert what his activities consisted during the middle of the night of July 10th, he acknowledged that he left the apartment three times. So it would have left and came back. He said that he went over to Vince Howard's house, knocked on the door, nobody was there, he came back. Um, and then he indicated that um, he wasn't sure, wouldn't give us a time frame, but he was out of money, uh, he only had a couple of dollars, and he may have gone over to his RV to get some money. Clearly, he didn't need money because he was able to present a $100 bill there at the quick shop, and he still had 40 some dollars after he made the purchases in addition to the gas, and then he was able to make the purchase there at the Walmart in Clinton um, after 7 a.m. of over $8. But then I would also note that even when um, Jared Brink pulled him out, he was offering him $100. So that's very relevant because it goes to the issue of credibility. The other um, issue I think that um, really falls um, within the context of this discussion is the fact that Mr. Dinkins will never ever provide a timeline for anything that he did. He's given Google Maps to draw locations where he said that he has gone. Bearing in mind his first telephone call to Aisha Langford was this. I just woke up and Briasia has gone. We know that the text came in at 8.08 a.m. Aisha was at work. She just checked in. She returns the call and then we got a series of calls after that where his first representation is, I just woke up and Briasia's gone. That certainly is not in accord with what all the other witnesses have testified to. As Lean Bean, and welcome to Donna Just Being Real. I think we need to stop thinking that all of these women are victims. Some women are just as trifling, I, I agree, if not more than the men. It seems to me that she was complicit with whatever was going on. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because it just doesn't add up. I'm going to put the link in so people want to, you know, jump on the panel and share their thoughts and opinions because share them with me. As long as we all be respectful of each other, share your thoughts because you might see something that I didn't see. Like I know as I'm going through this chat, I'm seeing things. I'm like, whoa, I didn't even think about that. Mm, mm, mm. All right, let's get back to it. Resume. This is prosecution giving their closing. After this, I will show um, defense giving their closing arguments. Resume. At any rate, we know he leaves at 3.38 a.m. And then a particular import is mile marker 124 at 3.44 and again at 3.45 when Detective Obert looked at the... Um, video surveillance speed from the um, DOT, it showed a sedan passing. Now we can't see what it is, but those variables are very important, particularly when we go to what happened with Jared Brink. And then we throw those time variables into the time variable of what was determined up in the area of criminal evidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. We 
all love to play. Whoa. Whether you What definitively ties Mr. Jenkins to the year in Kunal implement during the early morning hours of July 10th, where Briasia, Briasia's remains were located? The court has heard deposition testimony, and then the court had the opportunity to watch the video um, uh, surveillance, or not the video surveillance, the interview of Jared Greek. Jared Greek, we know, lives somewhere further um, north and to the east of Kunal Implement. We know that Jared Greek works at Linwood Mining here in Scott County, so essentially what he's got to do is he's got to travel from Clinton County. Um, the most direct route would, quite honestly, be I-80 down um, along on the 280 to get off in the area of River Drive so that she could go to Buffalo where Linwood Mining is at. Um, he describes his morning routine, he gets up, he gets dressed, he gets his cup of coffee, he gets on the road, and he heads out. Uh, Mr. Brink had indicated that when he was on Highway 61, and this is where we have a plot pointed, um, he was traveling south, and a black male waved him down, who was standing along the side of the road. This black male subject, he described as wearing a dark shirt. Interestingly enough, he describes a black male as being more muscular, but when he saw the back um, image of Mr. Dinkins leaving the quick shop, he only had on that t-shirt that completely exposed his arms and showed a form-fitting t-shirt on his body. He indicated that this individual was more muscular in terms of what he could see. He described him wearing a black hat, which is exactly what D.L. described and in, in his interview about how his father had a do-rag on and how he had a cap on. He described this individual as having jewelry on. That's exactly what D.L. described his father wearing when we got to see his interviews yesterday. But even more importantly, he described the subject wearing a white denim type of short that had some type of screen imprint on it, um, and he remembers there being blue. And when he was shown the rear image of Mr. Dinkins leaving um, the quick shop, he said, those are the shorts. Jared Brink also described this black male subject as having a mole on the right side of his nose, and the court had the opportunity to see the uh, press release that the Davenport Police Department had prepared and had put out. And sure enough, what do we have? We have Mr. Dinkins with that mole, no, mole right beside his nose. At any rate, he stopped there. They go over to the area of 270th Avenue, and the vehicle is perpendicular across 270th Avenue, as if it tried doing a three-point turn, but the rear wheels went off the shoulder, which the court knows is a steep incline, to the west, and it got stuck. And so he had to pull the vehicle out. The vehicle that he describes is a maroon Chevy Impala. He describes the interior as being tan, he thought it was leather, but at any rate, he also described it being clean and there being that white ox court. That's an exact match to what we have in this particular case, Your Honor. Everything that he described matched Henry Deacon's to AT. And then we know based on his cell phone pinging, and then I'm going to have to have a court look up there because I can't tell. Maybe you can see it on the screen. But I think his phone, Mr. Brink's cell phone, is hitting off that cell phone tower in the area of Kunal Implement directionally toward the area of Kunal Implement at 4.27 a.m. in the morning. So, we've got the cell phone hitting there. We've got the area that is shown, number one, up here where that contact occurred on Highway 61. When we go to the map of 270th Avenue, where the vehicle was perpendicular across the road, that's the location that Mr. Brink had noted when he was shown those maps by um, Detective Sean Johnson. And then you take that and you overlay it with the locations that Special Agent McMillan had collected soil samples from after Briasia's body was recovered, and the GPS coordinates. We know of the 10 soil samples, three of those were inclusive of soil samples on Mr. Dinkins vehicle. There were a total of four soil samples taken from the undercarriage. Three toward the rear, those were matches. One toward the driver's side, toward the front of the vehicle, which is not a match. That is conclusive. Then we go back to the Impala. And let's talk about the Impala. When Mr. Dinkins presented himself um, to the Davenport Police Department, there's any number of areas that you could park right there in front of the department and walk in. GoDaddy is a partner that always puts you first. When he was being interviewed by Detective Obert, he initially presents himself as having been dropped off and that his vehicle was mobile and that a friend had it, but didn't want to give any information about who that friend was. Then Detective Obert discerned that maybe he might have some issues with his li license and that might be why he's reluctant. He says, I'm not concerned about that at all. You know, the whole thing is about finding Briasia. And Mr. Deacon still 
is not willing to give information about where that vehicle is at. By virtue of the BOLO that went out, patrol officers received that information over their MDTs. Officer Podar read that um, BOLO and happened to observe the Maroon Chevy Impala parked a block down and to um, the north there on Main. And then the vehicle was seized and brought to the Davenport Police Department. Jill Foster took photographs of that vehicle. And this was um, a topic of conversation um, that Miss um, Foster had talked about when we went around the vehicle. There were areas on the vehicle to show that there was the spray of muddy dirt on the vehicle. And you see it along the passenger side here in those areas. The other thing that's interesting about this, and the state's going to bring this back full circle, not only do we have soil around that vehicle that's consistent with it being up in this area, but then the other thing is that child had described how there had been a machete in the trunk of the vehicle, and one of the things that um, Sergeant Pfeiffer had talked about when they started to remove the remains from Briasia's skeletal, or remove the branches from Briasia's skeletal remains, he noted that it looked like a knife had been used to cut branches to lay over the top of her body. And so the state throws that in there because that gap is another connection to this area up here in the area of Kunal Empire. As for additional identifiers, Mr. Marie picked out a white ox cord. That's exactly what was inside that vehicle when it was seized. Mr. Brie, when shown these photographs or this photograph of Mr. Dinkins leaving the quick shop, it's an exact match. And of course, we've got the Maroon Chevy Impala that he described being shown by Joseph Adams after his wife had sent him the image. He picked out the Maroon Chevy Impala, and then we see the photograph of Mr. Dinkins there with the mole on the right side of his face. This takes us to the last portion of the story. And the conduct of Mr. Dinkins and speaks about volumes, uh, volumes about his involvement um, in the murder of Briasia. We know sometime after sunrise, Alma, according to Detective Hamas's testimony when she was doing the interview, she'd asked, um, uh, you know, <coughs> sell your device, um, what time the sun rose, and I think it was like maybe about 5.38 on um, uh, June 10th, or July 10th. Um, we know that Mr. Dinkins returned to the apartment sometime during the early morning hours. Um, sometime after sunrise, Andrea Culberson wasn't able to give us that time. But then we know that when he came up, he got DL, he left, he gathered up the children's clothing, which is very interesting, um, and then he goes to leave without his phone. Andrea Culberson insists that he takes his phone, so he takes it, leaves with the child, she discovers that there's another bag with the children's clothing, she calls him, he comes back. We see his movement through the video surveillance on the feeds. We see that vehicle going past the Quick Star on 53rd, and this is before the 6 o'clock hour. We see it going east on Eastern by virtue of the camera at Judson Court that faces out onto Eastern. Through the cellular data um, that was provided to us through Special Agent Veteran, we know that he traveled east on Eastern, back, or north on Eastern, I'm sorry, Your Honor, back east on Veterans Memorial, back south on Jersey Ridge, back to the apartment complex, which is consistent with him picking up the clothes, and then leaving. Then he goes back north on Jersey, and then we've got him at mile marker 124. I will ask the court to rely on its own recollection, but I think that that was about 6, 11 a.m. We know then that he went to the Walmart in Clinton where he purchased the Clorox, because DL tells us that his father had his cell phone um, in the cup holder, and the battery had been removed. And when his father went into the store, and we know he entered at 7.04 a.m., that he took the battery, put it in to play a video game. When he saw his father coming out, he removed it so he wouldn't get, us, get in trouble. It was that event that allowed us to develop what happened out in Clinton. We know then, by virtue of the canvassing and looking for video feed, we saw him coming past Posh Farms, past First State Central Bank, going into Walmart. We saw the video feed at Walmart. We see him going back past First Central State Bank, Posh Farms, and then back along mile marker 124. We know he purchased Clorox. DL described how his father went to two wooded areas. 
Um, and the one wooded area that he described, um, he described as there being woods, and then there was a road down and you could see a pond. That's Kunal implement. He described his father getting out of the car, and he described his father um, uh, um, having a knife and having wiped it off, and he knew it was Clorox because he could smell the odor of Clorox. Um, when we look at the travel times, if you drove past mile marker 124 and went the speed limit, it would only take you 22 minutes to get on Highway 30 and go past Posh, posh Farms. On the trip out, it was 32 minutes. On the trip back, it was 37 minutes. 15 more minutes on the trip back. And what do we have? When Briage's remains are recovered, we've got those clothing articles that are recovered, the shorts, the t-shirt, and the little broth. The court had the ability to see those articles of clothing as they were pulled out by Sergeant Pfeiffer. Then the court had the ability to be able to see photographs, but most importantly, the photograph that came from the state medical examiner's office. When you look at those black shorts, and this is what Sergeant Pfeiffer had talked about, there was discoloration in the fabric. And we could very clearly see it based on what the lighting conditions um, were when that photograph was ta taken at the state medical examiner's office. And you can see that discoloration. Very significant. If you have a child who has been sexually assaulted, you have the perpetrator's DNA that's present on that child's body. Bleach. Will kill that DNA. Criminal Stepanski had testified that they had made a judgment call about how they were going to proceed as it relates to the articles of clothing to see if there was bleach. So they noted discoloration on that white t-shirt, they took cuttings, and recognizing that we've got variables that are working against us. Creation has been out in the elements for a significant period of time. Her body has decomposed. The clothing has been out there in the sun, the wind, the rain, the snow. All of that compromises DNA. But when he went through the series of tests for those cuttings, he noted that Clorox has four specific elements. Those four elements were noted when the analysis was made of those cuttings. Then he described how he used water to try and pull things out of that fabric to do a pH test with Clorox being basic at 10. This came in at a 7. But he said, bear in mind, water will dilute the pH. And then Clorox, in a color test, will test a dark blue. This came back as a light blue, but bearing in mind, liquid will dilute the color. He couldn't make a conclusive determination, but the findings are very significant when you combine it with everything else that had happened and the defendant's activities in purchasing bleach. And that tells us everything about what was occurring. occurring. Mr. Dinkins is very savvy. He knew exactly what it is that he needed to do to destroy the evidence, and steps were taken to do that. And that is conclusively shown by lab report after lab report after lab report that ended up with negative findings. The only thing he couldn't control was the issue of the soil samples underneath his vehicle that ties his vehicle to that area. I think as far as the last points that I would make, and I'm just thinking about different testimony that was offered. I think at this juncture, really what it comes down to is this. What caused Creation's death? We heard testimony that she was shot through her left mandible. It traveled through her C3 and C4, out the back of her neck, and got caught in her little hair. She was shot twice, from front, on the right side of her body, to the back, <coughs> and that's where we see the damage from the bullets in the scapula. And Dr. Cruz, when asked to opine as to the cause of death and manner of death, indicated that she died of gunshot wounds and the manner of death was homicide. And then the final piece of the puzzle comes um, into play relative to those casings, I shouldn't say casings, those bullets that were found with Briage's body. Um, there were three. There was damage to some. However, when Mike Tate, I believe, talked about this, I get Mike Tate, Mike Schmidt mixed up, he talked about how he goes through the process of weighing that ammunition to get a sense of the caliber, and it was 38 caliber ammunition. That gun that was recovered from the pond, there were empty casings within that revolver. It was 38 caliber ammunition. While there was damage to the bullets, there were markings on those bullets that could be um, compared to the types of markings that would be generated from the Lassier Comanche 
Um, and when you stop and consider the manufacturing process and the types of markings that it leaves, it was consistent with it. And when um, Mike Tate ran the types of guns that would um, could be used to fire this type of ammunition, the Lassier Comanche was on that list. Your Honor, when you go through this entire sequence of events, um, while most of the evidence is circumstantial, and we do have some direct evidence, the evidence is, in this case is overwhelming. And the conclusions are clear. The child was taken from that apartment by a man who was not her father. She was taken so that the adult nor her brother would know. She was sexually assaulted, and then that child was murdered. And based on all of this, the state is asking you to find Mr. Deenkins guilty of murder in the first degree and kidnapping in the first degree. Thank you. We'll take our mid-morning break at this time. We'll reconvene in approximately 15 minutes. You are so welcome, Lamont, and welcome to everybody that's coming in here. Make sure you hit that like and share me on your social media. All right, um, I'm just waiting for this to start here. We can make it very, oh. very careful. Very careful. Okay, now we're going to hear what defense have to say in closing arguments. This is defense. We have to be fair now. We have to listen to everything, right? Okay, let's let's get back to it. Finger someone. Three more are always pointing right back at you. And nowhere in my career have I seen a case where the finger of accusation being pointed at a client has three more pointed back at the prosecution more strongly and more firmly than this one right here. I'm going to submit to you just very plainly that this case is being thrown in your lap because the prosecution doesn't trust you. They don't trust you to convict. Mr. Dickens on this evidentiary record. They want you to decide this case on motion. They want you to decide the case with cameras, media in the courtroom, all the officers sitting here. They want you to de uh, decide the case based upon that. Rather than this fairy tale that, they, that they've spun and this circumstantial, and I use that in quotes, <laughs> evidence case that they want you to believe. <coughs> Rhetorically, I want to look you in the eye. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Are you totally convinced that Henry Dinkins committed these crimes? Are you firmly and fully satisfied that the evidence that's been presented before you is enough to say that Henry Dinkins committed these crimes? Those are really the burning questions for you because that's what reasonable doubt comes down to. You know, our Supreme Court uh, has approved a jury instruction that says uh, based upon all the evidence, drawing all the inferences from the evidence, or in some cases, lack of evidence produced, would a reasonable person hesitate to act? And I would submit to you that if someone come up to you and said, did Henry Dickens commit murder in the first degree? Did Henry Dickens commit kidnapping in the first degree? Would you immediately say yes, or would you have to stop and think? There's no way on this evidentiary record that you would not have to stop and think, because there simply is no evidence to support the state's theory that this man committed these crimes. You simply cannot say, based upon what has been presented here, that Henry Dinkins set apart, set out on a plan to sexually assault this 10-year-old girl and then decide to execute her, because that's what it was. It was an execution. Any reasonable person would hesitate to act on this record. A person may have an opinion. I think the state has an opinion. I think the state feels they got it right. The state thinks that Henry Dinkins did this, but that's not the standard. The standard is, did the state prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? This is not a whodunit. This is not a whodunit. This is who proved it. I find it ironic that we're talking about Henry Dinkins committing sexual abuse upon Breasia Terrell, but we're not here talking about him being charged with sexual abuse upon Breasia Terrell. I find that very ironic, and so should you. I find it ironic that there's not one piece of physical. Now, I'm not trying to give Ham Hawk any credit, but defense has a point on that part. Because I don't think he's on trial for that. 
the prosecution put in there. But we all know what happened. You know why defense? They bring it up because it's we're going by your past history. Unfortunately, your past will have, you know, weight on your future. If your past is shady, people is not going to trust you. It is what it is. This is why we always tell, you know, parents, we tell our children, you know, make sure, be careful decisions that you, you, you make. Because what you do right now could affect your future. But they don't want to listen. Then when they reach their 30s and 40s, they'd be like, oh my gosh. Yeah, you didn't listen. All right, let's get back to it. Evidence that can say ever that Henry Dinkins touched this girl in any way, let alone even give her an untoward glance or make an off-color comment or tell her she looks nice, even give her a compliment about her appearance. None of that. What we have is, and what this court is being asked to believe is, by fact that he wasn't paying attention to his biological son, therefore he must be some insidious intent toward a non-biological child with whom he had a relationship. And because he spent more time in the bedroom watching her play a video game and playing a video game with her and with Andrea Culberson, that got the wheels turning and that got the libido moving. And there's absolutely no evidence of that. Andrea Culberson didn't give you any indication that Henry Dinkins was acting untoward toward B.A.J. Durrell. Durrell. In fact, the evidence you've heard is quite the contrary. The evidence you've heard from D.L., we'll talk a lot about D.L. down the road, but from Andrea Culberson was that everyone was happy that night. It was a good night. You heard it from Aisha Langford as well, that when Briasia come down to get her clothes, she was happy. She was learning how to be an AT&T operator. It was a good night. Henry cooked dinner that evening for the kids. And he cooked dinner for Aisha as well, even though she's a stepchild. Aisha liked going over there because she liked the snacks. It was Henry, I'm sorry, Briasia, because he liked the snacks. Now, was Henry Dinkins set about grooming this little girl with vanilla Oreos? I don't think so. Okay, that's a theory that the state may have. That speaks volumes as to what this case is. It's a case built upon conjecture. It's a, big, a case built upon supposition. It's a case built upon uh, assumption. And it's a case built upon hypothesis. I think you heard Detective Obert say, it's the theory. That's in the record. It's the theory. We don't convict people on theories. We convict people on evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's just not here. The special question, of course, and the state admits this when they went into the a sexual assault uh, discussion right off the bat, is why? What motive did Henry Dinkins have to hurt this little Everybody that's coming in here, um, shout out where you're from. What state you're from or if you're out the country, whatever. Just shout it out. And Patricia said, Patricia says, good evening, much. Donna just being real. And chat, I'm just coming in the chat listening from the bushes and hit the like. That's right. Thank you, girl. All right, let's get back to it. Make sure everybody shout out where you're from. Resume. Girl. None. Absolutely none. In her 10 years of life, he had only been good to that girl. Was he there every day of her life? No. Was he there to provide and be the perfect father figure? No. Uh, but we're not judging him as a father. We're not judging him as a stepfather. But he was there enough for her to have a relationship with him. He was there enough for her to feel comfortable going there. And most importantly, he was there enough that Grandma, Danita Gardner, felt comfortable sending her along. I would submit that Danita Gardner would not have sent her child, her grandchild along if she felt any inkling that this child was in danger, that Henry Dinkins would somehow sexually harm that child. That's common sense in this case. And in fact, uh, you heard Henry's, or testimony that Henry first said, no, I'm going to spend the weekend with D.L. And then D.L. kept saying, come on, uh, uh, Briasia, come on, Briasia. And finally, and you can see D.L. doing that. He's kind of a, a, a hyper rambunctious kid. Uh, Briasia relented and Grandma relented as well. But the plan, if there ever was one, was uh, at that point for uh, Briasia to come along. This man had not seen D.L. in over a month since the cookout. And so it was never discussed for Briasia to come over. 
So to think that he had some sort of preconceived notion that he and Briasia were going to engage in some sort of illicit activity just isn't there either. Um, Aisha Langford was informed that Briasia was over there, and she was fine too. Both Danita Gardner and Aisha Langford testified that relationships between Briasia and uh, Henry were good. And neither one had a problem with, with Briasia spending the night, even though it was the first night at this new location. So the, the crime just has to make sense. And the state knows this. The state knows this. I mean, they absolutely know this. So they, they try to spin this yarn that he's standing in a bedroom in this very small apartment, and um, DL says he peeks a couple times and sees Dad spending more time with Briasia. We're going to rely on that as a motive, a motive to commit a sex act, that he sexually abused this child. I'd say not. And then there has to be some connection to that and why he would want her dead. And the state has tried to put together this elaborate time frame uh, with evidence that they say could be Henry Dinkins uh, to say that he actually sexually abused her. Now, Ms. Cunningham called Henry very savvy. I disagree with that. I disagree with that wholly. I mean, look at this man right here. He is not a savvy individual in that regard. If you think about and compress this down to almost the most ridiculous time frame that we have, everybody in that apartment was, uh, as far as the children, and Miss Culberson at least, is asleep by midnight. Um, Mr. Dinkins was in the Davenport Police Department by noon the next day. That's a 12-hour window. A 12-hour window for him to accomplish a lot of things um, that just doesn't make sense. Those 12 hours uh, include waking up Briasia, who's a tattletale, who joins him voluntarily. And evidently, the theory is that some sedan, they can't identify that car as Mr. Dinkins, first of all, it's just a sedan, goes down to his RV, uh, and these people get out of the car down to the RV. They can't put him in the RV, this in the area of the RV. Uh, Henry rapes her. And then uh, evidently goes back again to probably cover up the crime. Comes back and you know he's at the home at 3.30 a.m. At 3.30 a.m. he's in the house um, and Briasia is seen by Miss Culberson outside the Impala. I think it bears noting that no one ever put Briasia inside that Impala. No one. Didn't even try. There wasn't even an effort to put her in that Impala. It was the assumption that she was in the Apollo. At 3.30 then, they assume that these two take off. He drives her up to the area of Kunal Implement, 20, 30 minutes, uh, kills her. Somehow takes uh, the time to uh, shoot her three times. And we'll talk about the shooting. Somewhat cover it up and get back to uh, Jersey Meadows around 5.30ish and pick up his son. And he and his son go back to Clinton. It's seven o'clock, they're at the Walmart in Clinton. They take their time coming back. If you believe uh, uh, DL's version of the events, he's covering it up with leash out there. And they're back in town by eight o'clock. At eight o'clock to 12 o'clock, um, there's phone calls being made. He's supposedly moving about Clinton. But then this time also, he's discarding clothes. He's showering and scrubbing himself up, uh, making sure all possible crime scenes are sprayed with bleach, uh, and, and doing it 100% successfully. So not only has he got the mindset to be able to do all this, but he's doing it to an absolute T. There's absolutely nothing left behind. They want to talk a lot about bleach and how bleach destroys DNA, but they also have to get you to assume and understand that not only if, if their theory is right, that Mr. Dinkins not only did it, but he did it to the point that he destroyed any possibility of DNA at any crime location on any piece of evidence. Because what they forget to tell you, Your Honor, is that they brought in the FBI crime team, okay? They didn't bring in just local people with local resources. They brought in the FBI crime team, and they spent hours, hours, combing that RV, okay? And in that RV, they took 
everything that they thought there would be DNA on. They took anything they thought there would be blood on. They took anything they thought there would be semen on. They vacuumed their little special vacuums that thought we didn't get any trace evidence on. They took hair. For crying out loud, these people were dressed in uh, uh, Tyvek suits, uh, rubber, rubber boots, hats. That's how seriously they took preservation of evidence. And what do we know they found in the RV? Nothing. They were asked to test for blood and semen. Because from jump, this case was thought to be Henry Dinkins raped this little girl. And that was their theory, and that's what they were going with. And the very first moment that man went to the police station, that was their theory. Can't convince me otherwise, Your Honor, because they were testing for blood and semen on July 14th. Why, why was they only testing for that? Why would they want all DNA to see maybe who else had been in there? Blood and semen. Their, their choice at that point was to make a case against Henry Dinkins. Not build a case based upon the evidence. You see, they'd already concluded that Henry Dinkins had done this. And now we're going to build the evidence around that conclusion and pick only the evidence that surrounds that conclusion. But nothing in that RV. Now, had she been raped in that RV, they would have found something. I would submit that to you. A hair. Some sort of DNA. But they didn't test for DNA. And that's not his fault. It's their burden. It's cool Breeze says, his lawyers purposely throwing him under the bus indirectly. I do feel that a lot of these defense attorneys probably are. Because when they start off with you, I'm just assuming... You know, that they, they, they start with you, they trying to get you, look, we got a stack of evidence. We got videos, we got DNA, we got this, you know, whatever it is that they have. Prosecution got a tight, tight case. Look, I can work out a plea bargain with you and we can see what we can do to judge and prove. But see, these, these idiots, these lowlifes like him, these ham hocks, these derelicts, they like, no, no, I'm not guilty. And I'm going to trial. Because he even said he wanted to represent himself. I think he dumped, he, he, he dropped a couple of lawyers or whatever it was. I'll show that video clip if you like. Let me know. So, he, he's full of crap. All these, these kills. I don't know what it is. They know darn well you're not going to win. But they just still want to go. Maybe it's just time away from the cell. It could be that. They get to sit there for a couple of hours. They get free water and probably get a nice little lunch. You know, and it's away from the cell. That's all I could think of. Because how do you think he was going to get away with this? How? That little girl was in your care. I'm just saying. These are all my thoughts and opinions. Let's resume. And I put the link in. If anybody wants to jump into the chat, feel free. Resume. I meant want to jump on the panel and share their thoughts and opinions. Feel free. Reason. Their burden. And they had that evidence back within a month or so. And they had no blood, they had, had no semen, and they had no trace evidence. And they had a good year and a half to say, you know what, let's send that back to the FBI. Ask the FBI to test it or send it on to DCI. They can do DNA testing on any cuttings or swabs or fabric or whatever. But what was the answer we got when I asked that? Of Detective Pfeiffer. My supervisor said no. My supervisor said no. Not his fault. Their fault. Their burden. They say they say they, she was assaulted in that RV. They need to prove she was assaulted in that RV. Not just say, well, there was cleaner bleach sitting there, so he must have cleaned it up. Okay. We now know we have a test for bleach. DCI, we heard Agent Stepanski. Okay. Let's have Agent Stepanski test it for bleach. There's no elements breaking down anything in the RV. We have it in a controlled environment, for Christ's sake. Let's test that area for bleach. But then, if it hadn't come back with the uh, answer they wanted, they'd pivot off that and say, well, you know, there's bleach and laundry products. We wouldn't have found it there anyway. But note, when they searched that vehicle on July 10, when they went into that vehicle, Hours after this young girl had supposedly been sexually assaulted. Hours after this man supposedly sprayed it all down with cleaner bleach. Hmm. I have to um, pause for Todd. Welcome, Mr. Todd. Welcome, welcome. Verdict on 915 at 905. 
Oh, so that's when they're going to have it on the 15th? Thank you for that tidbit. Thank you for letting me know. Hmm. Interesting. This is good. This is good. All right, let's get back to it. This is defense. Mitchell killed all the DNA and got rid of any evidence. No order of police was detected. And when, you, when you're going to kill DNA, Your Honor, I would submit that when you're going to kill DNA, you don't give it just a couple squirts. You make sure it's dead. You make sure it's gone. And in that enclosed environment, that small enclosed environment, you're going to smell bleach. But then they introduce these, these albatross pieces of evidence meant to scare you, meant to, to uh, prejudice you like the, the machete, which has nothing to do with anything in this case. There's no evidence that machete was used in any crime. There was no sharp force trauma. to Grazia Terrell and Dr. Graham, Dr. Cruz both said that it could have been, maybe should have been, if that large knife was used to harm Grazia Terrell. And look at that evidence. Look at it closely. That, that machete is brand new. Not a nick on the blade. The home, the edge of that blade is just like you bought it at the store. There's not so much as, as anything that would say uh, that was used uh, to, to cut a bush. It is brand new. But we have white fibers on there, and we tested it against some other fibers that didn't match. But you know, we'll forget about that. And, oh, we have a baseball bat. I'm going to ask you rhetorically again, what does a baseball bat have to do with anything? It's in the evidence, and we found it in the trunk. And baseball bats can be scary in crime cases, but there's no evidence to support what the baseball bat has to do with anything. Well, it's a prejudicial piece of evidence and makes Henry, Henry look scary. And then the hatchet. Well, the hatchet, you look at that as well, brand new. Brand new, never been used. Never been used. Has nothing to do with anything in this case. <clears throat> you uh, think back to the testimony of, of Danita Gardner. She was asked by the state about how Henry was with the children, um, how he disciplined, and if he ever disciplined uh, Briasia. <coughs> the answer was no. In fact, his discipline with DL was, was uh, not very often. Uh, but when he did, he made him run. He wasn't the guy that got physical with the children. Um, at the cookout, he brought stuff for the children, brought him candy, things like that. He was an affectionate guy. No markers that he was trying to groom Briasia for anything. Uh, they want you to believe that he was, he was that night. He's a SO. This is what they do. They very friendly with the children. Give them candy, act like I can understand you so well. They be online, charming these kids and grooming. Really defense? But I mean he's doing the best he can. We have to we have to face the fact. He's entitled for a lawyer. Everybody's entitled for a lawyer. And he's entitled to be, you know, represented. Hmm. Yep, I just don't understand why these lunatics these these ham hocks, low lifes want to put everybody go through this. I don't understand. I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. But they don't think they did anything wrong. That's the thing about it is they don't think they did anything wrong. Mm -mm. We just picking on them. We harassing them. Yep. Resume. In the bedroom playing video games and this idea popped in his head. Well, I'm going to molest this girl who I've who I think of as my daughter. And now the state wants you to say, well, because he didn't do one, two, three, four, five, rationally, during a time where I would submit to you, things were irrational. Your child is missing. Your 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 uh, son's mother's other child is missing. You may not think exactly the way that you would think in rational circumstances. So they're going to put judgment on that. They're going to put judgment on that. They're going to judge him as a stepfather and say, well, that makes him a killer. That makes him a sexual abuser. Bottom line is, the state developed their theory way too early in this case. And that theory was, Henry Dinkins killed this girl. Henry Dinkins molested this girl. So now let's go find the evidence to find it. And the problem is, they couldn't find it. They had all the evidence to possibly put her in that Impala. But they didn't test for the DNA to put her in the Impala. Because the FBI was told she was in the Impala. And when it came back that we didn't test her DNA in the Impala, then the brass at the Davenport PD said, don't test for it. Why on earth was that not done? 
I'm going to have Mr. Waters also show a couple of photos right here, and I'll have them state for me which they are. Which one's this, Joel? It's 12-17. Picture 12-17. This is a photo that come from the rear passenger side of the Impala. What I want the court to see there is you'll see one, two, three water bottles. You'll see a can of Pringles. You'll see a, a, a cup, a black cup there. What do people do with water bottles and cups and Pringles? They eagle, they drink the water bottles, they sip out of the cup. What do people do when they drink out of water bottles, drink out of cups and eat Pringles? They leave, they leave a DNA behind. Those weren't seized or handled for DNA either, all of which could have put Brianna Terrell in that Impala. None of which would have proved she'd been sexually assaulted, but all could have put her in that Impala that night. But that was ignored. Again, shows the theory that they were looking through tunnel vision and had their decision made. He sexually assaulted her, and that's why she's dead. We just got to find her, and we'll build our case around that. Uh, Mr. Waters, show the other one. <coughs> this is sorry. This is 12-24, and this is from the rear driver door. And what you see there again, another water bottle, another uh, Diet Mountain Dew bottle. You even see what appears to be a kid's mask. Um, now, again, those were drank by someone. A mask was worn by someone. Those are some things we can get DNA off of, Your Honor. Uh, none of those prove sexual assault. You aren't going to find any blood or semen on those. I know that. You know that. But again, those are items where we commonly find DNA. They weren't tested because their mind had been made up that she was in that car. He had raped her. And they'd find blood. But again, they had the opportunity. They had the evidence for a year, year and a half. And they just chose not to because the bosses said, don't worry about it. When you, when you think about you think well. when you think about the uh, state's argument, um, they talked about how Henry portrayed himself as a father figure at the beginning of the interview, and uh, toward the end of the interview, uh, the issues between he and Aisha kind of came out that it was maybe a little antagonistic. Um, I don't know how that could be considered proof that he killed anybody. Um, any relationship between people, especially who aren't together anymore, is going to have that. You can be a father figure to someone and not get along with mom all the time. I mean, this court very experienced in things like that. Um, but she said that Henry tried to show the outward uh, perception that uh, Miss Langford and Miss Gardner had a sense of trust about uh, about him and that he would never do anything to hurt the child. That's not a perception. That's a fact. Those kids would have been there had those those two individuals thought that Henry would never do anything to her child. But since the interview got tense later on, um, something changed. Some of those perceptions must have changed, and that's just not true. That's not just that's not true. The evening went well. It was July 9th was a good time for all those people, and there was no need for anyone to concern or worry. And even Aisha said it, it went well, and she was there later that night. The, the death of Brigadier, we need to talk about about that um, because it was a it was an execution. It was a terrible death. Okay, I don't think there's any doubt that she likely was shot right where she was found. Um, and think about the person that pulled the trigger. Uh, I would submit to you that the person that pulled that trigger. Okay, overthought says. Then who is the child seen on the camera in the driveway of his RV? I missed that part. I didn't know about that one. Overthoughts. I missed that one. Ooh. Mm. Okay, let's get back to it. Make sure everybody vote, 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 and hit the like because I don't understand. I only have 88 likes, but it says I have 249 people here. Come on, hit the like. That helps out your content creator to push them out there. Hit the like. And if you need to reach out to me for coaching, viewers requests, anything like that, in dating, love, relationship, feel free. you find my email address in the description. 
Resume. Was very close to that 10 year old girl. And he pulled that trigger one, two, three times on a 10 year old child. That takes a special kind of person to do that. That's not him. So fold that kind of person into the theory that the government wants you to understand that, okay, we're playing video games. It made DL mad, uh, at least to the point where he noticed it. He has this idea that now I'm going to uh, molest this girl, and I did it, according to the state. And then I take her back home, according to the state. She gets out of the car, right? She waits for Henry, supposedly go get go in and get a gun, which we heard no evidence of anyone ever seeing him with a gun, ever seeing him with ammunition, and I don't think the evidence came in that he was hiding something. Andrea Culberson said she just couldn't see him with anything. There's a difference. And then she waited for him to come back. Now, I think the government argued that he knew that she was going to tattletale on the fact that he had just molested her. So he went in and got this six-shooter that no one knew anything about never seen before, with no additional ammunition anywhere. And I submit to you, that's pretty telling, because where you see a gun, you see ammunition. The likelihood of someone having a six-shooter with no additional ammunition anywhere is zero. Where you have a gun, you have ammunition. You saw that in Andrea Culberson's gun. She had 50 rounds right with her gun. You don't just carry around a cylinder full of Winchester 38 plus P's. There would be 10, 12 bolts, even if they were loose. There's always extra. So, how did he know that Briasia was going to tell on him? You have to assume she said so. You would think she'd be distraught. You think she'd be upset. But instead, she stands outside the car, according to Andrea Culberson, and if you believe the state's theory, she waited. And then she got back in the car with Mr. Dinkins. And then he goes to a quick shop, and he goes in and gives seven glances, seven glances out to his, to his car. At 3.30 in the morning, I'm not sure that's such a big deal. But if that's your evidence you can rely on to convict this man, that's a stretch, Your Honor. That's a big stretch. And he takes his keys with him. At 3.30 in the morning, I would submit, he should. And he filled up his tank with gas. Well, he needed a full tank of gas to go to Clinton. People fill their tanks all the time when they need gas. The fact that he's filling it up to go to Clinton <coughs> is another speculation. That's not circumstantial evidence. That's speculation. The, the seven nods out to the... Uh, the car, that's not circumstantial evidence. That's speculation. They're guessing on what he's doing. That's all they're, they want to call it circumstantial, but it's all theory. It's all guesswork. It's all speculation. And this tattletale, who you would assume has just been through a very traumatic, terrible experience, according to the state, stays in the car. Doesn't tattletale to anybody else. There's people in that parking lot, people going in and out of quick stop, shop. Um, she has a good mama, she has a good grandma. I'm sure she was told about stuff like this. She's in that car, uh, no evidence she was bound, no evidence she was restrained. Um, <coughs> the video of the car, the car just sits dead still right there. Um, nothing going on. So evidently she rides along, they go up to Kunau Implement, and then he takes her down in the woods. This girl, he's fond of at least and he walks her into the woods and then essentially that from a very close range this man has it in him to stick 338 slugs in her head and chest and leave her there and then have the time or whatever to try to cover it up this is all this is all Melvy, I understand exactly what you're saying. I saw the case of Sora and thought that I could, couldn't could have anger that strong towards anyone. Then came Ham Hawk. Mm -hmm. Now, Sora she's talking about is Daryl Brooks, the one who took his car, his vehicle, his mama, his mama's vehicle, and throw through the, um, drove through the parade and killed all those people. Low life and represented himself. If you want to check out some of my past commentary, I did commentary on it. Sewer rat. Piece of crap. Both of them. Y'all need to be in the same cell together. You, um, tailor your business. 
All of y'all need to be in the same cell because something wrong with y'all. You should have never been born. All y'all should have never been born. For what reason? And the thing that bothers me about with these cases, I have to say is, why are these people being their enablers and supporting them? Check out my past commentary I did on Nathaniel Rowland. This low life, driving around, looking for a victim, portraying like he was some sort of Uber driver, and picked up this girl and stabbed her, I think over a hundred times, in the vehicle. Then trying to sell her stuff. And claim he didn't do it. And then his mama going to get on the, get on there talking about, oh, he's a good boy. And the judge was like, well, why? Because I raised him. He's not the one. The judge had to shut him down. Shut her down, the mother. I don't understand why these people being enablers. Just face the fact. You birthed a monster. It, it is what it is. It's not your fault. Mommy and daddy laid down and had Satan Jr. Mommy and daddy laid down and had the devil's daughter. It is what it is. You could be the awesome, great parent and do everything for your children. Great environment, love, support, and everything. But sometimes your child just could be born bad. I do feel that some people just born bad. Or it could be the environment that could change them that way. You know, but I'm just saying is don't fault yourself as a parent or whatever, but don't sit up here when you know there's stacks of evidence that's proven, there's video cameras showing your child did the crime. And you're going to still sit up there? I, 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 I just don't get these type of people. I don't. I can't do it. I can't. I, I love my children with all my heart, but I will not support nothing like this. Not at all. Reason... thought about him so he's already covered up the sexual assault and now he's now he's killed her he's executed her now he's got to cover that up i mean this man is the best cover-up artist speak on tv but now he's done that now he's done that he followed the state's theory and then he decides to walk over and dump the gun in the in the water get rid of the gun now, they talk about time frames. You know, time frames, they, they can be fickle. You know, people drive different speeds, people stop along the way, whatever. The time frames prove very little without something to put, to, to put with it. So they, use, they try to use Jared Brink, okay? And don't get tripped up by Jared Brink. Do not get tripped up by Jared Brink. I'll let Mr. Waters use the pointer and point to the first uh, picture up in the upper right. This is the, the information of Jared Brink. In the first picture way up right, that was the pictures of the uh, vehicles and the photos of Mr. Dinkins that were shown to Jared Brink. Now, I will. Okay, RJ says, Donna, please go to the prosecution rebuttal to his closing arguments because I'm about tired of hearing his voice. It's irritating. I'm just trying to be fair. <laughs> trying to be fair to play both. All right, let me see, let me see, because it is kind of a lot. Okay, we're just going to do about uh, just a few more minutes, RJ, and then we're going to, I'll fast forward and we get into the rebuttal, okay? I completely understand how you feel. I'm just being fair, you know, you want to play both. There's people out here want to hear what the defense have to say. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get back to it. Direct you to his deposition testimony and his interview, Your Honor. Mr. Brink told officers that he could not pick Mr. Dinkins out of a six-person lineup. He did say that one of those on the top, I believe it was the upper right-hand corner, maybe the one in the middle, could have been the driver of the car if he gained 50 more pounds, okay? He also, in his deposition testimony, under oath, under oath, used the term Malibu that he pulled out. Not Impala, he says Malibu, okay? Remember, he's a car guy. They, they kept saying he's a car guy. He says he pulled out a Malibu. He also says that uh, there's a white ox cord, right? But he also said that car had, had a, a tan interior. That's a tan interior. I'm not sure it's a tan interior. The state, which buttresses my argument that they found only the evidence they want, do self-tower analysis on Mr. Brink's phone. Now, we know where Mr. Brink lives. We know where Mr. Brink goes to work. You started off something hard, Jay. Everybody wants me to end this. I just saw like the ending of it. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop with this. I don't want to bore y'all. I understand how y'all feel. 
Okay. Um, hmm, let me fast forward it. All right. Enjoy the music while you wait. Let me find it. Because it is kind of, gosh, it is long. Okay. I think we get into closing now. All right, let's get into it now. I think I got it now. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want me to show the, um, I have time. If you want me after this, I can show the body, the body cam again. And also, if anybody wants to come on the panel, feel free. I put the link in there. So feel free to come on to the panel and share your thoughts and opinions. If nobody wants to come on, I understand. I'll just show the body cam. Just let me know what to do. All right, let's, let's get to it. Ms. O'Donnell. Ms. O'Donnell. Thank you. Ms. O'Donnell, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you have a preference where I stand or don't stand? Wherever you would like to. Um, I know that it might be easier for everyone to hear if you're closer to a microphone. We do have the microphone positioned over here if you'd rather stand. You ready? I am. Okay. Speaking of ignoring evidence, what the defense is ignoring here is that Mr. Dinkins is the last person seen with Briasia Terrell when she is alive. And who made that observation? Who placed him with her is Andrea Culberson, the defendant's own girlfriend. She is the person who said, I looked out that window at 3.30 in the morning and I saw Briasia right next to that Chevy Impala. I saw her there, she was alive. And then the defendant leaves, car is gone, Briasia is gone, there was no one else in that parking lot. That is the last known sighting of Briasia. Andrea Culberson testified that when she saw Briasia, she actually felt relieved at that point in time because she at least knew, oh, she's with Henry. We know where she is. She's with Henry. However, after they left and as she testified, she couldn't even put into words what she was feeling because she was confused. She didn't know what was going on. She didn't know why he had taken Briasia out of their apartment at three o'clock in the morning and then again at 3.30 in the morning. And because of the nature of their relationship and who they were, she didn't ask. But she didn't call the police. She didn't go searching for Briasia because she knew that Briasia wasn't missing at that point. She knew where she was. She knew who she was with. And so when the police showed up at their apartment. Overthoughts. I'm sorry to pause it, ladies and gentlemen. Overthought says, I can't wait till the judge explains why he choose guilty. That is what I'm waiting for so much. It's the judge. Because sometimes the judges don't really give their thoughts. They just do the sentencing. But sometimes they do share it. But in this situation, I believe he has to share his thoughts. He can't just do sentencing and say he's guilty. Why do you feel guilty? I am dying to know what he has to say. That's what I'm so much. That's another thing that's more intriguing. Excuse me. What's really intriguing about this trial because it's a bench to hear what the judge have to say. So I'm dying to hear what the judge has to say. I'm with you over thoughts. All right. Let's get back to it. This is the rebuttal for defense, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you vote. Well, while I'm here, I pause. Let, let me read the, um, the votes. I got 247 people here. Only 116 likes. Hit the like. And only 57 votes. Hmm. All right. Let me read the votes right now. Will Ham Hawk be found? Be found? Question mark. 90% says guilty. 3% says Donna, not guilty. 7% says, eh, I'm not sure. All right, let's get back to it, ladies and gentlemen. Shortly before 9 a.m. in the morning, suddenly looking for Briasia, wondering where she is, wanting to search the apartment, looking for her. You can see on that video how much Andrea is hesitating. She doesn't want them to come in and search for Briasia. She wants to make sure that Henry knows, gave permission to come into the apartment because she is confused because she knows that Briasia left with Henry. 
and that he's the last person to have had her. So why are the police here looking for her, searching for her? Why is Henry saying it's okay for them to come in and search her apartment, knowing full well that he's the one who had her last? Patricia says... He's like an old sack of potatoes with dusty, musty dread sit on top. I agree. <laughs> I can't, I can't. Reason. Been trying to figure out why the defense has not been trying to attack Andrea Culberson's credibility at all throughout the course of this trial. There was no impeaching her. There was no trying to question her on her timeline and on her events or any of those facts. That's because they can't. They can't do that. But who did they chose to go after? And, and that, that was DL. There was extensive questioning about his credibility and about what he saw or what he didn't see in his statements and his various statements. Why? When so much of what he said has been corroborated, not only by Andrea, but by video surveillance. Um, by other types of evidence. Why are we attacking this child and not Andrea Culberson? And that's, that's because if you look, look at the information that, that DL was, was providing, not only, only does he describe things that are corroborated, like I said, by, by other evidence, but he also places the defendant out at Bruno 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 on the morning of July 10th. He, based on his statements, corroborates that the defendant didn't search, made no efforts that morning to go look for radiation, like he reported that he had been doing. DL, the morning, the morning of July 10th, when he was interviewed by police, and as the court, the court got, got to observe, is a carefree kid. He's unconcerned. His sister's lost, but, you know, it's, it's kind of just not a big deal at that point in time. He is not appreciating at all the severity of that situation. He doesn't understand what is going on. And so when he is interviewed and he starts talking about going fishing with his dad that morning and they, the places that they went or that his dad pulled out bleach and was wiping off this big knife, he doesn't understand the significance of the things that he's saying or why those things may be relevant or not relevant. He talks about his dad being stuck on a dirt road and that there were these guys, these six fishermen who had to push his dad out. His dad had gone fishing. His dad paid them a hundred bucks. Now, again, if you, from those statements, those are not things that DL actually saw. Those are things that his father had told him occurred. And now this is, again, on July 10th, well before we knew anything about a dirt road, well before we knew anything about this Impala being stuck, months before Jared Brink came forward to talk about pulling a Chevy Impala out of the ditch on 270th Avenue, mere feet from where Reage's remains were found. DL has no idea what significance any of these things offer. But included in those statements, and when he does drive them around, he starts to describe more. Again, on July 10th, he recognizes Schmidt Road. He talks about this RV. He describes this fishing place as having a little hill. And he kept saying you had to go down there. He walked down there. He took bleach down there by the water. They do drive him to Credit Island, where he recognizes it. He has them park in the gravel. He shows them the path of travel that he watched his father take. He stayed in the car. And sure enough, there are footprints there. Um, again, he talks about this machete it being cleaned off with bleach. They go to that RV. There's a machete there. And again, talking about those driving around in that Impala. And then you heard the testimony from Jim Peters, who has those cadaver dogs. Where did his dogs hit? Credit Island, the RV, that Impala, all places that the defendant went after we submit that he had killed Briasia Terrell. All places that DL said that he went the morning where he's supposedly out searching for Briasia. Those are not just coincidences. Again, the, the testimony from Jim Peters about what the cadaver dogs actually do is they hit on the smell of those uh, molecules that attach, that scent that attaches to objects like shoes that a person could have been wearing at the time that they committed a crime. 
shoes that were in the, that Impala. Shoes that he wore walking around Credit Island. Shoes that he wore when he was standing around his RV and then went into his RV. Shoes that he later disposed of and that the officers were never able to recover. So again, that odor of bleach, DL said that he smelled it. Even on July 10th, he could smell bleach. Something that again, Detective Tharp testified to, that when she first opened that trunk, she could smell bleach. Um, which is consistent with somebody opening a bottle of bleach, cleaning it, using it, and then throwing that bottle of bleach back into a trunk. Not necessarily submitting that the defendant took bleach and wiped down everything inside of that trunk, but just that there was an open container of bleach at some point in time in that trunk, which would emit an odor of bleach that wouldn't necessarily last for days and days and days. Now, again, when we're talking about DL and the areas and things that he described, that area near Kunal Implement, now he testified that after they had gone to Walmart and purchased bleach um, on the morning of July 10th, they went to this dirt road where he observed his father walking with those um, bottles of bleach and dumping out bleach all over some bushes. Again, when you're looking at why are we attacking DL's credibility, what is the point of making him look like the person who's just making things up? So again, it's because he's placing the defendant there where Briage's remains were found. Now, this whole statement about whether DL actually saw the defendant shooting Briasia, that wasn't something that he even testified to on direct. That was purposely brought up by the defense on cross-examination, again, to attempt to impeach DL. That wasn't something he actually testified to. And again, what was the purpose of bringing that up, if not to try to discredit absolutely everything that he provided? And while we don't know what DL did see, didn't see, what actually happened, what he may have heard while he was out at certain locations. Uh, it is worth noting that without missing a beat, when asked what color the gun was, he said silver. And when officers found that gun, they described it as a stainless steel gun. That's how they labeled it on the um, evidence records. And if DL was just going to try to make something up and just try to come up with some story, it is odd that he'd pick silver as the color and not black when most guns in this world are black. And even a child knows that. Again, when we're talking about what the state ignored in terms of the evidence here, what the defense is also ignoring is that Henry's DNA was not found in the Impala. His DNA was not found on the, in the RV. When we say that Mr. Dinkins is savvy, if you look at those actions and the things that he did on this particular evening, leaving his cell phone at home, to charge when he has cell phone chargers in his vehicle. Wiping down a machete with bleach, a machete that we submit was used to cut branches. That's it. Those are steps taken that show the level of thoroughness that he had when it came to covering his tracks that day. Taking the battery out of his phone after being forced to take his phone with him Again, those are steps that he took to try to cover his tracks, to try to make him untraceable. Obviously, bleach, we've heard the testimony, it does kill DNA. Um, but obviously, this is a case as well where Briage's body was not found for months, several months. Sandra, welcome, welcome to Donna Just Being Real. I feel like he was going to do something with his son but couldn't go through with it because what was his purpose of taking him out of the house and to a very pond Briasia was found dead. You know, I've been getting a couple of comments saying the same thing. That's something to think about because that is weird. You come back to the house, you get your son and got him in the car getting bleach and you go driving over to this area. It's a possibility. But then he probably chickened out. And didn't do it. Because it, it just doesn't add up. Why did he go and get his son? But I'm so glad that the little, that little boy, or young man, that he put that battery back into that phone so they can ping him. Mm-hmm. Glad he did. All right, resume.
almost nine months, I believe, between when she went missing and when she was recovered. You heard the testimony from Mike Schmidt about what the environment can do to DNA. And it is worth noting that even in the clothing that Breja presumably died in, they didn't even find her DNA on those clothes, clothes that she probably bled in, that she had some level of decomposition in, and yet her DNA is not even found on those clothes. To, so to suggest that because there's just no DNA at all, that that's what the court needs to hang its head on is simply not reasonable. When the court heard testimony from FBI Special Agent James McMillan, one of the things he described was when you have any missing person case, your goal is to start with that person, the person who's missing, to try to establish their last known whereabouts. And then you start with the people who were the most intimate or close to them, the people who saw them last. And you try to establish a timeline for their last known whereabouts in an attempt to either exclude them as somebody who could potentially abduct them or include them. And that is exactly what this investigation did from the get-go. They were provided information that the last known person seen with Mr. Dinkins, or I'm sorry, with Breasia was Mr. Dinkins. And from that information, the Davenport Police Department, the FBI, the DCI Crime Lab, all set out to try to establish the last known whereabouts of Mr. Dinkins, to try to exclude him or include him as a potential person who could have abducted Breasia. And they were never able to exclude him, ever. When you look at his behavior, the evening that she went missing, according to his own statements, at some point, he searched for her, he found out she was missing, he never woke up Andrea Culberson, he never woke up Tutorius, he never made a single phone call. In fact, he wasn't even thinking about his phone in a time like this, when you have a missing child, which is just a crazy statement to make. Instead, he got in his car, and he just left. He couldn't point to a single location that he drove to. He couldn't point to a single door that he knocked on. He made absolutely no effort to actually search for Briasia because he knew she was never missing. He knew exactly where she was. He didn't need to go look for her. He didn't need to wake up anybody else and alert them to the fact that Briasia was missing. In fact, he was trying to avoid having to alert anybody to the fact that Briasia was missing. He didn't count on the fact that Andrea Culberson woke up and knew he was gone. And in fact, according to Andrea's testimony, when he came back to the apartment at 3.30 in the morning, she heard him kind of quietly open the door and quietly try to step upstairs because he was trying to avoid causing any sort of attention or bringing attention to himself. He was trying to be quiet and discreet. Now, the defense wants to argue that there's no evidence of a sexual assault. And I would just note for the court um, that the state's not required to prove that the defendant actually sexually assaulted Beresha Terrell. What we are required to prove is that when he removed her from this location, from this apartment, his intent was to either sexually assault her or to cause her serious bodily injury. And I submit to this court that there is really no reason why an adult male would take a child at three o'clock in the morning from this place where she's sleeping to another secluded area where she had never been um, without some sort of ill intent. Whether that is sexually abusing her, whether that's causing her harm, there is no reason to do that at three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning um, without some sort of nefarious plan for that child. And there was a decision made, a decision made to harm her, to kill her. Briasia knew Henry. She could identify him. This is not some strange child. This is somebody that she knew intimately and that he knew if she were to tell what he did to her, that she would be believed because Briasia is a truth teller. And so a decision was made that he had to kill her to that apartment after he had taken Briasia down to that trailer. And I submit to the court, why would he need to come back to the apartment? What was the purpose of doing that? Why take that risk that she may be seen if it wasn't 
to get something that had to be so important to him, something so necessary for him to achieve his goal of killing Briasia, he came back for a gun. He went to that closet. We know that he has access to weapons. There was a knife under the mattress, a machete under the mattress in that apartment in his own vehicle. He had an ax, he had a bat, he had an empty knife sheath. And then in the, the RV, he had another machete. We know he has access to weapons. It is not unfathomable to think that what was in there, but when he came to that apartment, he snuck up the stairs, he went to the closet, he dug something out, concealed it on his person, and then he left. Why? Why did he need to come back there if not to grab a weapon? He then took a video there where he's acting odd, keeps looking out to that car, and there was a lot of discussion during the defense clothing about why Briasia, this rule follower, this tattletale, why she wouldn't have tried to run, why she wouldn't have told somebody about what was happening at three. I see you, BG, creeping through the back door. Blessing to you, classy lady. Um, Regina Love, that's the famous question. I have a question. If she saw her outside at, was it, three-something in the morning, why she didn't go out there to bring her back in the house? That's what we're all trying to figure out. This is why, uh-uh, Andrea, you need to be charged. Because first of all, if a child is in your home, you held responsible. You're responsible of that child. And that's your home. Because it wasn't Ham Hawk's home. He was just over there just using you, taking advantage, use a place to put his head down. Because he was sitting in the, um, in the body cam. He's like, who is that? What? Well, uh, you know, she's just a friend. And then she's on the stand saying, we've been together for six years, you see? See, ladies, you have to realize that in dating. When a man, how he claims you, what kind of title does he put for you? Mm -hmm. It tells a lot about the man that you're dealing with. Yes, it does. What a shame. So many red flags in here about dating and relationships. It's just pathetic. It really is. Mm -hmm. Reason. Three thirty in the morning when she was outside of that car. And again... I it shouldn't be lost on this court that we are talking about a 10-year-old child. A 10-year-old who did trust Mr. Dinkins. This was her brother's father. This was somebody who, according to DL himself, she had been having fun over at this apartment. She enjoyed the snacks. They were playing games. She was having a great time. And then this person took her from her bed, took her to some trailer where we submit he then sexually assaulted her and hurt her. And then now is taking her around again to this apartment where she had never been, didn't know anybody else there, an area of Davenport she had never really spent any time in. And we're expected to believe that she should have just ran away if she was really that scared of him. Because apparently that's what we're going to do now is blame Briasia for not getting herself out of that situation. And how frightened she must have been in that moment when she's outside of that car. This man had already hurt her, and we don't know what types of conversations or what he may have said to her in those moments. And I submit he threatened to kill her brother. You move, you say anything, I'll kill D.L. And this child, this rule follower, follower, this protector of her brother, would have stayed. She would not have ran off or done anything in those moments if she thought that that would somehow impact somebody else. And again, when she's driving to quick stop or when he drives to quick stop it's the middle of the night she doesn't know where she is we expect her just to get out and run and we're talking about what that fear that she must have been feeling and that experiencing in those moments The defense wants to argue that 
because Mr. Dinkins didn't act the way we would expect him to act when his child is missing, that that's what the state's hanging their head on. But that's what we're saying here is he's guilty because he acted funny when she went missing. And what is worth noting here is that there are behaviors and there are certain actions that do go towards somebody's consciousness of guilt. And if you look at Mr. Dinkins' actions and the way he was reacting to what was happening in the situation, his behavior is so completely goes against any way that a parent would act if their child was missing. If you wake up at three in the morning or whatever time that he's, because again, he wouldn't give a time, uh, and noted that Briasia was missing, you wake people up, you call the police, you start banging on doors, you call her mother, you start looking for her, you panic, you panic. And instead, he's driving to Clinton, Iowa to buy bleach. He goes down to Credit Island with the DL. DL. We know at some point that he changed his clothes because he is seen um, on the quick shop video wearing one outfit. You heard testimony from Andrea Culberson that when he came back to the apartment to get DL, he had changed his clothes. And she noted that that was very odd because he hadn't changed them there. So that meant he would have had to have changed his clothes somewhere else. And then again, after you see him at Walmart wearing um, the same outfit he's seen when he meets with Officer Burkle um, outside of that apartment, he changes his shoes. Those are not actions. Those are not steps people take when your child is missing. You don't care what you're wearing. You don't care what your shoes look like. You are panicked. You are upset. You are freaking out. You don't have the wherewithal to go, you know what, I think I'm going to wear different shoes now. I should go change them. And it shouldn't be lost on the court that the shorts that he was wearing that you see in the quick shot video, the shoes that he had on, none of those items were ever found. The two bottles of bleach that were purchased from Clinton, never found. What we do know is that after the defendant left the apartment the morning of July 10th, after making contact with uh, Officer Burkle, his phone records show that he was in the area of his sister's house. And we know again from phone records that his sister and his mom were home at that time. And it's awfully convenient that after there's a brief period of time where his sister and his mom are home, they leave. They leave and go up to Tama to go gambling, which is also a very odd reaction for finding out that Mr. Dinkins' daughter, according to him, is missing. But none of those items that he had were ever found again. Now, the defense wants the court to completely discount the Biden. And again, that's because Jared Brink places the defendant on July 10th outside on that road of 270th Avenue, right where Briage's remains were found. And again, if you're looking at all of the information that Jared Brink provided, if he is describing somebody else that is not Mr. Dinkins, then Mr. Dinkins must be the most unlucky man alive. Because what you heard from Jared Brink was that on this night, around 4.30 in the morning, a black man flags him down on Highway 61 because his car got stuck on this road on 270th Avenue. The man gets in his car. They drive back to this area where whoever this other person is is also driving a maroon Chevy Impala. And they also happen to have light colored tan interior seats and also happen to have a white aux cord that's plugged right in there. And the right tire of this vehicle is the tire that just so happens to be stuck on this ditch. Again, that right tire where seized, that vehicle was seized on July 10th, you can see that there's visible dirt on the car. And that area of the car is where those soil samples were matched for that particular area of that particular road. Uh, again, this man offers him $100, um, which, again, is the same night that we know the defendant paid $100 for gas. Um, the same time period where the defendant reported paying $100 to some fishermen and told that story to DL. Um, this man didn't have a cell phone or he had no means of calling somebody for help. That's why he had. Everybody that's coming here, shout out where you're from. 
what state you're from, or if you're out the out the United States or whatever. Just share, just share, just share if you didn't do it. All right, resume. To flag down somebody on the road. And again, wearing those shorts, the same shorts that he identified, um, the defendant wearing, the night that Briasia Terrell went missing, the night that he was the last known person to see her on the night, the one night that she has ever stayed over at his house. If we're talking about somebody else here, again, that's just not reasonable. It's not reasonable to think that all of those different factors and all of those descriptors that we're talking about a different individual that isn't Mr. Dinkins. <clears throat> Defense counsel brought up the state's burden of proof in this case. As the court notes, it is not the standard is not being totally convinced. It is firmly convinced. Uh, they also note the language, this hesitate to act, um, which is in the instruction that the Supreme Court does not prefer that we use. However, if we're going to be talking about this hesitating to act, the stopping to think, I would submit to the court that stopping to think and considering all the evidence is, is actually the job of the fact finder. That doesn't mean you're hesitating. That doesn't mean that there's some sort of pause on your part to have to look at all of the evidence here and looking at the totality of it to decide whether that you are fully and fairly convinced. That's, in fact, the court's job as a fact finder is to deliberate um, and decide the evidence from the evidence there. One statement from the defendant that we heard testimony from with those inmates at the Clinton County Jail who testified that they heard the defendant after after seeing a news story about this story, about Briage's disappearance. He turned to them and he said, they are never going to find her. And those people thought that was very odd. They thought that was weird. You heard the testimony from, I believe it was uh, David Baker about how he immediately took that to mean, this guy knows way more about what's going on. He knows more than what he's talked about. And the court has seen what this area, Kunal Implement, looks like in July. It's heard testimony about the trees and the different brush in that area and how difficult it is to actually see anything during that time period. You could be standing mere feet from where her body was found and you cannot see her because they're never going to find her. That is what he reported to those individuals. Um, one thing that uh, the defense and the state can make a person, this was an execution. When he drove Briasia to this place, a place she had never been, this wooded area with barely any lighting, the fear that she must have felt, not knowing where she was going, not knowing where she was take, going to be taken and what was going to happen to her. And then as he got her out of the car, pointed that gun at her, and she knew that she was going to die without ever seeing her brother, without ever seeing her mom ever again. Again, that statement, they are never going to find her. Your Honor, when you look at all of this evidence here, and you look at the state's burden of proof, this is not a situation where the state just focused in on one person, one person only, and you look at all those facts. The defendant's actions that night and what he did to this little girl, to Briasia, he needs to be held accountable for that. And the evidence clearly shows that he is guilty of both of these offenses beyond a reasonable doubt. And we would ask that you return a verdict of guilty for both counts. Thank you. Thank you. I will take this matter under advisement and have a ruling as quickly as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was the, the closing arguments. 
So waiting for the verdict. And thank you everybody who's telling me it's on the 15th. Okay. Because I didn't know the date. So thank you for sharing that, that tidbit and everything. Oh, I see Classy in the house. And peace to you and blessings. All right. Um, I don't know. Did anybody say they want me to show the um body cam? We can show that body cam again. Then I'll let y'all go. We can end off with the body cam. It's about, about 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Let me know. Let me look up the body cam. All right, y'all can listen to the music um, while I look it up. Okay, ladies, and let me switch. I'm going to switch to the body cam, so give me a second here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna um, let me turn this music down some. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna watch the body cam. Then after this, I'm gonna let y'all go. We, we done for the for the night. All right. Um, and stay tuned for tomorrow because tomorrow I'll be focusing. Hopefully, I'll be able to. It depends. I'm gonna focus on the new trial that's going on about that um Hollywood therapist. And she had a stalker. My mother told you my child, my child's all about dating relationships. And a stalker, and he threw her basically off the balcony. This man is insane. Uh huh. And there's more to the story. So I'm gonna be doing some clips on that tomorrow. You're welcome to come if you like to. All right. And of course, I will follow when the verdict comes in and do something. If it's in the daytime, unless I'm working from home that day, then I can stream it live when the verdict goes through. If not, it's gonna have to be in the evening. It depends. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into this one. The body cam. Interesting. And a speed on 1.25, ladies and gentlemen. Last name? Langford L A N K F R D. Date of birth? 8-28 of 1991. Uh, address? Uh, 614 West 63rd Street. Apartment number one. One number? 563. Yep. 676. 4247. Okay. Uh, and Henry lives here. Yeah, I guess so. This is where you told me to come. Um, we don't even know how long she's even been gone. Yeah. Now listen to what she says. I guess so. This is what he told me to come. So you just let your kids be somewhere you don't even really know where they at? I know I never did that. Resume. Bree is so beautiful. Yes, she is. Isn't she gorgeous? This a doll. A doll. And her whole life was taken away, her whole future, by this ham hock. Resume. Uh, what's uh, her, your daughter's name? Bri Asia B R E A. E A. S I A. 
B R E A S I A. Yes. Okay. Sorrel. T E R R E L L. Okay. What's your middle initial? D. Her date of birth. Do I see my girl Lovejoy and bless her to you, girl? All right, reason. Um, okay. What's up, Henry? So when was the last time you saw her? She was in the house. When was the last time you saw her? Last night? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. When was the last time you saw her? She was in the bed when I was coming. She was in the bed? Yeah. When you went to bed last night? Listen how he says with him. Who is him? That's your son. What do you mean? With him. Wow. That's how you address your son. Resume. Last night? Okay. Um, this is crazy, man. This yeah. is like, you know what I'm saying? I know she fucking going fucking hysterical because. Yeah. D I N. K I N S. Uh, your date of birth, Henry? August 2nd, 72. Is this your home address? No. What's your address? It's down by Ross and Karina. This guy just... Yeah, I, I just know that. I you don't know, know your I address? I don't know address. Do you know your phone number? Uh, uh hell no. I don't know that either. That's what I got it on. Henry, you don't know where your daughter is? You don't know your address? You don't no, no, know no, your no, phone no, number? No, no, for real. I'm How you don't know your address and how you don't know your phone number? He says he doesn't call himself. Yes, we all don't call ourselves. But we know our number, don't we? See, these sociopaths, they think people are stupid. One thing about sociopaths, they lie, 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 and more lie. And they usually have a lot of criminal records. Sociopaths are known to have criminal records. They like they have a bunch of speeding tickets. You know, because they just don't, they don't go by the law. They think their law is what they want to do. They don't follow rules. But they're extremely charming. Extremely charming. You know what I mean? And they, they're so charming that they, they so charming, charismatic. They usually get jobs in high positions. Depends on some. Unless you got the dusty kind of um, sociopath. Not really. You know what I mean? He be in and out of jobs. He can't stay at a job no more than a year because it's always, oh, it's them. They, they picking on me. They balling me. No, no. It's you. Because either he was lying or stealing at the job. Decide you was going to come in and make your own work hours. It doesn't work that way when you're employed by somebody. You know, stuff like that. But we can get into more detail about social past. But I do feel, you know, that this ham hock is definitely a full-blown sociopath. Sociopath slash narcissist. Yes, I do. These are my thoughts and opinions. Resume. You think I'll be lying, but... Well, no, it's just... It's, it's kind of a, I, don't, I don't call myself. I know, but you gotta know your number. You gotta know your address. I don't, so this is your girlfriend's address here? This is a good friend. Okay. Okay, here's my phone right here. Okay, what was she last wearing? In the bed. Uh, what she have on some shorts? What color? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. What's her height and weight, you think? She's a little taller than he is. She's okay. She's a little taller than that. She's probably not like this here. Okay, what's her, what kind of, what's her hair look like? She long, has dreads. Long, long. Dreads, yeah. Long. long and dreads hair? Yep. Like, shoulder length or Down. middle of the back? Down here. Okay. Mid back dreads, right? Is that how we would yes. label that? Yes. Um, she had shorts on. Does she, have, does she still have white shirt on? She had that long. That she had the shirt that you gave her. The white shirt. White all white. white all white t-shirt. Yeah. Ever jumped into a swimming pool only to be greeted by a? And you guys don't have alarms or anything on your doors if the door is open? No. Okay. Um, and listen, I know this sounds dumb. I, I've lost my kids too. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do who Who have you called? Who? Oh, what doors have you knocked on? I don't speak well. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But I called her. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And she told me she was at work. At first, I was riding around looking. Now, if I'm correct, the girlfriend said on the stand, they moved in there in March 
of that year. Was it 2020 when this all happened? They moved in March to that apartment. But that was in July. That's when, you know, Briasia was considered to be missing. So they only moved there for a couple of months. Reason. So how long ago did you use it? Been a, an hour? It's been a couple, couple, hours. couple hours. Couple hours. Okay. Couple hours. Um, with grandmas, have we called? That's, that's what I just asked. She knows all that. Okay. Do we have a picture? She does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She got the picture. Who's the girl that lives here? Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. So Andrea's last name. He did a picture of her. You don't have, have nothing with you right now. Okay, that's fine. Have we called um, family? I've called everybody. I have my okay. uncle out riding around. My mom's Man, on the way out here. My friend's on the way out we've here. We've been every okay. fucking way. And, and she's she's going to be with a friend inside some apartment. That's most why likely. I said I'm, I'm going to still look. Okay. We don't know anybody out here. That's yeah. She would have never. She would, How many? She would have never. First she, of all, she would have never woke up at eight o'clock in the morning. She would have I, never. What do you mean? Eight o'clock in the morning. I'm just saying. That ain't what I said. I never said. Hey guys, guys, this isn't the time to fight. Exactly. I don't give a fuck about you walking, nigga. You lost her though. How did I fucking lose? Because you was watching her, Henry. What the fuck do you mean? But hey. I'm gone, sir. Come on, D. Listen to me. Well, you guys gotta, you guys gotta come together right now. This isn't a time to fight about it. Okay. Um. So well, hey. If you, how am I supposed to, what, what do you want me to do? I got everything, though. I got everything. See how she stepped on me? You know I mean, like I fucking, like I, I got no picture. I got no, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? Right. You know what I'm I get it. I do Henry, I get it. I get All it. I can do is look. I get it, Henry. Henry, let's go inside the apartment one more time. Look, this happens. More often than you think, we just, I mean, well, I understand why she's upset, but I when I'm, I'm trying to help, she can't run away upset. from me. You can't I don't want to deal with the issue. Yes. You got to keep it up with it. Yeah. You know that. I learned that a long time ago. The mother walking off like that, I, I still can't get over it to this day. What do y'all think? Share your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I just can't get over that. She threw her hands up in the air and she walked away. Wow. Reason. Um, how many times have you guys stayed out here? This is their first time. Oh, it's the very first yeah. time she's ever stayed here. And so she has never stayed. She has never stayed here. So I wonder just. This is such a small. We get. She's not in our look. Want to boost your website conversions? Meet Hot. I'm fucking mad. She's gonna open the door, man. She's she, she's gonna open. Thank you, Frown. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Reason. Now, watch the girlfriend with the oversized white t-shirt. Mm-hmm. This woman I said a million times, the girlfriend, she need to be on the next episode of For My Man. Because it was all about her man. She didn't care about that kid. She didn't care about the kids. All she cared about was him, huh? Making him happy. Making sure he don't go away. And ladies, we got to stop this. You picking the wrong men to decide to go all out for. This man is a low life. And six years, you had to discover it. Yeah, some people can hide a mask for a long time, but for six years, nah, nobody's that good. Eventually, the cracks is going to happen in the mask. <sighs> She's so pathetic. Resume. Well, 
What's her name? Hello. Hi there. Are you Andrea? Yeah. Okay, Andrea. Um, what's your date of birth, Andrea? Nice. So tell me about, like, when was the last time you saw her? She was here. When? Okay. And you guys never heard her come down, walk out. There's no forced entry or anything like that. Uh, okay. Um, do you mind if I just come in and take a quick look? I'm not concerned about anything else. I just want to come in because probably 50% of the time we still find them inside the place um, when this happens. And oh, I kind of do my right right now. What's that? My face is kind of right I listen. I go in all sorts of places. I don't care how big. Is he aware of this? What's that? Is he aware of this? Yeah. What's that? Is he aware of this? Yeah. Who care if he's aware of this? You said this man was unemployed. He's laying up in your house unemployed. Everything is basically in name, the cars and everything. He, she, she was basically that woman. What I'm getting from watching this child. These are all my thoughts and opinions. She was that woman. See, these low lives, they have different type of women for do different things. She was a woman that was gullible that she was put everything in her name. She probably had good credit and everything. So he'd be like, yo, 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 get this car, put it in your name. Yo, yo, get this gun and put it in your name. Because if I'm correct, those guns was in her name too. And what I, I can't understand is, why would you have children in the house? You got guns all over the place. Nothing is in a lockbox. Sleeping on top of guns and knives. Oh, no. She should have went to jail for that, if anything else. All right. Let's see what she got to say. What's her name again? Was there any fights or arguments or anything last night? Bree is her name? Where was she sleeping at? Your bed? So where were you guys sleeping at last night? You guys slept out here? Can you look in the closet again? Huh? I know, I'm just telling you, you'd be surprised. Well, we've. I know, right? So she was sleeping in the bed with her brother? Mm -hmm. And you guys slept out here? Okay. What time did you guys wake up? Up. Now, uh, me, I was still asleep. I don't know what time everybody else got up. Well, what time did you wake up? Oh, goodness, I can't. I, honestly, I can't. I don't remember what time. Okay, like 30 minutes ago, two hours ago, two hours ago. Okay. Uh, do you she here? Like, has she ever played with any of the neighbors? Okay, are you going to come out and help look or not? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of it. That's the end of the um the body cam. What a hot mess. All she's worrying about is it's okay with her ham hop for y'all to come in. Is it okay or not? What did he say? You know, this is really pathetic. You know, I understand when you got these good men that's really treating you well. 
They providing, they protect, and give you in the world. Yeah, you know, you stand by your man because he's a good stand-up guy. But these type of creeps like this, I don't understand why are these women over here supporting crap like this. Why would you even lay down with something? Look at him. Just look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Pure ham hock. Just look at him over here. Well, I believe he's all these, like, different shots. He think he's cute. He think he's fine. But he pulls these type of women. It is what it is. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to end this. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, everybody, for uh, engaging. Um, uh, what Sharon says, psychopath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could be a combination of sociopath and psychopath. Yes, I agree. All right, Adrian said, why is he asking his son? Yeah, you noticed that, right? Asking his son. And he even addressed his son, he knows. He just pointed at him like, that lets you know what kind of relationship. He used to say, my boy, my son, my little man. No, he didn't do that. I want to look up and find out how many other kids does he have. Because I know this is not the only children he has. Not at all. Alright, so everybody. Um, if you can, if you like, leave some feedback at the end of this live in the comment section. And thank you everybody for shouting out from where you're from and all this good stuff. All right, so this is the end of it. Everybody has a blessed night and a safe night. And stay tuned for some more of Donna just being real. And remember, date smart, not thirsty. Because when you date thirsty, you're going to be a target of being used and abused. You're going to find these type of ham hocks or these ratchet, low-life chicks men. You know, men that get so caught up with the big booty and the smile. Sometimes... Those women could be your biggest nightmare. Mm -hmm. And ladies, be careful for these men that's overly charming and, you know, come into your life and stuff like that. You have to watch them, and especially when you're having children in your home. Stop letting these low lives move into your home. This is ridiculous. Eating up the kids' cereal, playing up the kids' PlayStation. The children scared to come out the room because he's around. It's ridiculous. All right, that's enough. Let me stop talking. Everybody had this as a blessed night and a safe night. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hitting the like. If you didn't hit the like, make sure you do. And stay tuned for some more of Donna Just Being Real. Mm -hmm.